Daddy's dungeon. Daddy's what? The fuck is Daddy's dungeon? Daddy's dungeon. <laughs> Daddy's fucking dungeon. All of you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? <laughs> And like uh, one of the bolt cutter guys just messaged us today and was like, this design is actually insane. <laughs> I can't believe you did this. That was your idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we we were like some of my homies uh, in an, another group chat of mine were using it as like a reaction image. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's perfect. <laughs> I just pictured the trucks and the car. It's like ideal, but it was awesome. So I remember like you were on stage and you said this band started as a joke. Yeah. Like yeah. how did this all arise? The lore behind it? This I love telling this story because it's so stupid. Um Andres, our drummer, uh -huh. he is the also the drummer of God Off. Yeah, yeah, five seven booking. Um he is awesome, I love that dude. He we were on tour with God Awful. It was a Shiki God Awful Marte Buena last year in the summer. Uh, it was like beginning of June. Um we are on tour and I was, I think I was in the back of the SUV and I was talking with uh, our vocalist at the time, uh, Kevin, our drummer, and Caesar, our second guitarist. Mm -hmm. And we were all like, uh, I think we were, we were listening to some like ignorant music, you know, like God, uh, God's Hate, just beat down, like World of Pain and stuff like that. And we were on that stretch of highway, f like right past Oxnard to get to Berkeley. And it's just like... Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. literally not. It's just one way each way. And I just saw semi and big trucks and shit mm -hmm. and I saw it's farmlands and all that and I was like I want to make a beatdown band called Big Ass Truck because I think I think uh, one of one of my friends was like damn look at that big ass truck I was like dude what if we like, just started like that I said that in passing and I guess they told like <laughs> they they took it serious and they told Andres uh -huh. and Brett and they were like uh, Andres came up to me and uh, at the show that we were playing that day he's like hey Big Ass Truck <laughs> I was like, oh shit! <laughs> so it, it that happened in June. Yeah, that was in June, and then months went by, and uh, Andres would text me. He was like, "Hey man, like, what are we doing? Like, I want to do another." He was like, "I want to do another project. Like, we we should do something." And all that I was like, "Yeah, man." He's like, "What what's up with Big Ass Truck?" I was like, "You really want to do that?" He's like, "Yeah, man, let's do it." And I was like, "All right, all right," and I kept pushing it off, pushing it off, and then um, September thirtieth, I want to say was Mosh for Youth 4 okay. and God Awful was on it uh -huh. um, and I went up to him because I, I noticed like more time was passing he was getting busier and shit and I was like I can't let this slide like I want I want to do something with Andres before he's too busy to do anything at all so I went up to him I was like hey man if you're serious like 100% serious about this I will text Manny our producer he, uh -huh. he also produces a, uh, he did Desoectomy Smoke 909's first stuff and uh, Ishiki he's doing Ishiki uh -huh. now um, I was like I'll text Manny right now for a date next week and uh, we'll start working on it and immediately he was, like, he was like yes do it I was like okay and I texted Manny. He was like, "He's like, all right, man, sounds good." And then, like, I, I think it was like two weeks later, went in the studio and we made the first song, "Big Ass Truck." Uh -huh. Like, I think we made that in like two hours. Wow. Yeah, and uh, it's like I, I don't, I just got like some breath of life in me when we went in, and it, we were just getting creative as shit. We got a bunch of modellos and shit, and we were just like, "Let's have just let fun. it flow." It was like we were just having fun. That was the most fun I've had writing a song like ever. Honestly, like it, it, that and like "Big Ass Dog" were the f most fun I've had writing a song. Because Big Ass Truck was just ideas flowing like crazy. Big Ass Dog was done in 30 minutes. <laughs> and it was just like me just having fun with like the lyrics and shit. So, but yeah, it all, it all, as like, as much as like people like to hate on the fact like that a, a, a people would be like, oh, your band started as a joke. Big Ass Truck literally started as a joke. But we're taking it serious now because like see what the difference is awesome. like you could say like bro we're really in the scene though like yeah, yeah. like all the members are actually in the scene even yeah. though this band started as a joke so yeah they can't really fucking hate too far exactly like everyone everyone in that band has had a hand in something in like IE hardcore at the very least mm -hmm. so especially Andreas of course because he's totally booking shit like crazy that's an extremely busy group of people yeah. Yeah. that's why like Big Ass Shark's been getting hit up for shows a lot and I've been had telling like Virtually all of them, like ninety percent of them, like, hey, Big Ass Truck is like a six show a year band. <laughs> like we are, we take them very sparingly because everyone in the band is has has main projects. 
that they're working on that have way more shows. Yeah. Um, I think just today I shot a show down because of that. And I was like, yeah, we, we, we're, for the rest of the year, we're taking on no more than like eight or ten shows. The very most. That's like pushing it. Um, kind of like a God's Hate kind of thing. You're only you doing go. festivals, only yep. doing real big, crazy shows like that. Literally about to say, we're taking the God's Hate mentality. Is uh, only, only like crazy offers and festivals, you know, like... Yeah. And like I forgot who said it the other day but they were like uh, you, you're gonna be like a, a merch core band you're gonna have more merch than you do shows like <laughs> I think it was Sergio that actually said that um, when we got the Onda but yeah that's, 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 that's like ideally. ideally yeah exactly yeah we don't wanna we don't wanna get too busy with it and we also don't wanna drive people out yeah. of the guy's yeah. truck so you're saying you're gonna do like max 8 to 10 shows a year right yeah do you guys plan on making any more music with it Oh, hundred percent, dude. Yeah, like like this summer, I want to get back in. Like, I, like I want to get back in in June. Um, I want to talk to Manny again and uh, do something. We have some ideas for like some singles and stuff. No, maybe not like an entire record uh, coming up, but down the line, I definitely do want to do like an LP um, with Big Ass Truck and just like. I mean, everything we release, I'm just gonna have fun with. Like, it's it's literally the fun project. I just like what like. You say you go in the studio and you said it took you like what thirty minutes for Big Ass Dog. Yeah, Big Ass Dog was thirty minutes. What what goes through your mind like when you're writing lyrics and like writing the you know the music part? Uh, and, it, and is it just you doing the creative writing process or is it like a group homie type of thing? I I I think the only one Jacob, our guitarist, he helped me write uh, Smokey Smokey and the Big Ass Truck. He helped with that main riff and like. Uh-huh. Because that, if you listen to Smokey and the Big Ass Truck, it starts with that banjo, and underneath the banjo, there's a bass line. It's like, dan, 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 da, 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 da. Oh. I took that bass line and I made it into a beat down riff. And Jacob helped with like everything after that, like pre choruses and all that stuff. So I was like, we, we, we transposed that riff to a beat down and we used it into a, a main like verse chorus. Yo, that's sick. that's yeah. crazy. So. <laughs> I, I mean I did majority of like the guitar riffs and stuff like that but obviously Andres did all the drums he that's his entire writing style is the drums um, Manny had input Manny that's why I love working with Manny Manny has some of the best like heavy musical input everyone that's looking for a producer that's a homie of mine is doing a heavy project I, t- I immediately uh, tell him go to Manny I tell him that first Especially if it's like a new project, because he'll get them on their on their feet and he'll get the ball rolling for them. Like it, it, he, he's been doing this shit for so long that like he knows the ins and outs of how everything works, how, how like the formula of writing heavy music, and how, he knows he has like a PhD in breakdowns. He's an encyclopedia. A PhD in breakdowns. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he's an encyclopedia. Exactly, dude. He's fucking awesome, and he's so chill. Like one of the nicest people I've ever met in the scene, and. Um, he he'll he'll like guide you through everything. He'll take you. He's very patient and like as he'll make a million changes. And I know he'll make a million changes because fucking undress. And I'm talking to you, undress. He fucking does so many changes. <laughs> I remember the last day of recording for Big Ass Truck. We were doing corn fed, and uh, we finished everything. We got the basic drums down that Matt, uh, Manny had written. He wrote the basic drums down and. Uh, we got down to it. We're like, yeah, we're good. We're good. He's like, Manny, like, you good? He's like, yeah, hey, you guys good? What about you, Andres? And Andres was like, oh, yeah, I just got a little thing. Like, And he looks at me. He's like, yeah, I think it's going to be like 10 minutes or something. Two hours later. <laughs> Two hours later, we're, we're like, okay, we're good. <laughs> kind of like that whiplash scene where, like, he's, they're making them all try out for the part, you know? Yeah, exactly. And they're, and they're staying there for That's hours so late at night. <laughs> Wait, when you guys are, like, creating a project... I, well, me personally, I don't know about Hoser, but I I never really touched any instrument, and I've never made music or nothing like that. How do you start? There, uh, for me at least, it always started with an idea okay. that like is that, uh, something in my head. Like Ishiki, um, Ishiki started because I watched Blade Runner. Uh-huh. I saw the movie Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and I was like, uh, I, I just thought about like the whole theme behind it and like consciousness and stuff like that. <laughs> And uh, the first EP is about, like, uh, it's about uh, AI that realizes its sentience uh-huh. and is like, I what the fuck, why am I being controlled, and breaks out. Yo, that's terrifying, uh, by the way. Yeah, it's horrifying. But, um, so each song on that record is, like, 
uh, is a story that takes place and like it ends with uh, I, I, I made him like die in a, in a sense um, but that idea was in my head for like months and so I went out and I bought a, a focus right uh-huh. and I bought uh, a guitar and everything everything I needed to record and I I made breakdowns is it Shiki like your first band no no I was uh I was in a, um, I'm, I'm like, a, it's like Sergio said in your guys' last time, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of unk. <laughs> but um, I, it's not nearly as, I'm sure he gets it way worse because the Ruin guys are just like relentless. You, although the Muerte Buena guys, those are my closest friends, they, they make me feel old like crazy. <laughs> those motherfuckers call me unk all the fucking time, man. But um, I, I was in a band in, uh, I want to say the second half of 2013 up until the first half of 2015, which is when I went to the military. That was the only reason I got out. And uh, I basically had like a six year like hiatus from the scene because I was in Virginia and then I went to Japan. I, I did three years in Virginia and then I went to uh, three years in Japan. Um, but that my biggest regret is not like engaging with the local scenes in Virginia and especially in Japan, dude. Oh, dude, that would have been Japan's insane. Japan's underground hardcore Crazy. scene is nuts. The Japanese mosh demonstration, bro. Yeah. That shit, it's, it's like that there. And I've seen the videos. You know what, though? And it's not only that because it's like they go ham with fucking anything they do as far as like yes, all dude. the drift meetups and the car meetups yes. and just Skateboarding. anything, yeah. you know, Crazy. skating. And the crazy thing about it is to like, Japan is so organized that um, the car meetups, th- there's no problems. There's no like people spinning out, hitting people. Trash. They know how it works. And afterwards, there's no trash all over the floor and shit. There's no bullshit everywhere. They're clean about it. They, they know how to handle everything. They're respecting the pizza Paula. You know, they're, they're respecting, they're respecting the, spot. the yeah, they're respecting the spot. Yeah, respecting exactly. the spot. Yeah, exactly. And they are the masters of that. There's there's no there's no like trash cans on the street. Like anywhere. If you're walking down the street, you can't find a trash can, but there's no trash on the street. They're so respectful of their country. They love it so much that they take care of it so well. There's nothing. It, it's it's ridiculous. What was your favorite thing about like being over there? Uh, the culture shock. At first, it was a culture shock because uh, I, I tell people all the time it was like when I showed up. It's uh, there's a lot of things I had to get used to, especially getting stared at because like I had this at the time, this tattoo, and they were very like not anti tattoo culture, but. Um, they told me at least that it's like Yakuza affiliated, but the Yakuza is like, they're not dead nowadays, but it's not nearly as much of a problem as it was in like the eighties. It's a lot more underground now. Yeah. I think in the eighties there were like 450,000 members and today it's like 40,000 or something like that. Uh, at least that's what it was when I checked in like 2021. But, um, yeah, the culture shock was awesome because it's not like, it's not scary like oh you better understand this or else they're gonna kick you out or something uh-huh. like that it's like if you don't understand something they'll know like you'll show up and they'll be like oh he's American I'm probably gonna have to show him this and they're super respectful they show you anything you need to like know and uh, Japanese nationals are required to take uh, I think it's like a year or two of English uh-huh. like basic English so like majority like 85% of them know how to do a conversation with you or like a basic conversation so if I was like lost in the street looking for a bathroom, I can go up to him and be like, the signal yeah. bathroom. And they're uh-huh. like, oh, over here. But um, yeah, the culture shock of that, like the first like six months I spent like uh, just getting used to how things were. But it sucked because I, I showed up there September of 2019. And for wow. the first like six to eight months, I literally was in Tokyo every weekend just with my homies, just like looking at stuff. And then COVID happened. Oh. Yep, and I got locked in place for... I, I legit got locked on base for at least nine months. Uh, and base is only like 15 miles wide, So, but it has all the amenities I need. Yeah. But the, the military and Japan in general took that shit serious. Uh-huh. Like, they were like, no one's leaving. If your military leaves, they're getting locked up. Yeah. They're getting like, yeah, you, you're you getting sent back home. So I was on base for like nine months straight, just fucking doing everything I need to do on there and then after that they like slowly by quadrant opened it up and it wasn't even fully open by the time I came back to California <clears throat> but uh yeah that my biggest regret in Japan was uh not going anywhere else besides Tokyo <laughs> like I, I went to like uh the shopping districts around the area but I, I my main place was Tokyo like, I should have went to Osaka I should have went to Hiroshima like well, like even uh 
don't they have like a really good train system there, like bullet trains and oh, stuff like amazing. that? It, it, dude, it freaking throws like New York's under the water, dude. Really? Because I've I've been to New York too. Dirty. Oh my god. It it it's New York's train system is uh, well managed. But Jesus Christ, man! It it's, smells. It smells like shit. It's well, you have like dirty. trash on the floor. And yeah. then you, I know you've seen the rats. Yeah, big ass rats. <laughs> big ass, big ass rat. <laughs> yeah, so I, next I, I, I've been told too. As soon as uh, as soon as you get into New York, you just instantly smell piss. Accurate, especially if you're near a subway. You know. Um. But yeah, no. The uh, uh, it's just that's the main problem with New York's uh, transit system. I think. I, well, uh, train at least. Um, is just dirty as hell. Uh-huh. Um, Japan's is insanely clean. It's ridiculous. Like it, it's like you're riding in a hotel. It, it, it's nuts. Um, and like the timing of everything is spot on. It, I I remember hearing that if they were late, if if a train was late, like even like a minute, uh-huh. they the the driver gets out and like apologizes. Oh wow! Like he gets out of the front and apologizes to everyone in line. So they're like. They're on time like crazy. I even saw this one thing that they were doing in Japan. So it's it's for the highways mainly, but it's to avoid uh, people falling asleep while they're driving. They're like these lasers. The lights, yeah. You know, you know how they have those things in Fast Track where you cross uh-huh. and the cameras and stuff? I heard about that. Yeah, dude. They're, so they're lasers yeah. that shoot across over your head to uh, bright colors to keep you awake. It's literally like a, a, a rainbow that shoots over and it's like supposed to shock the senses and just oh, be like, shit. whoa. Dude, I yeah. would love that. Yeah. I'm a, I would love that. Yeah. In America, you only have the, the bumpy divider to wake you up. So you gotta like soar back. Yeah, I'm a sleepy soldier here, man. Sometimes yeah. uh, it sucks. Yeah. The commute is a little bad. I feel that. But when those weren't uh, implemented when I was there, so maybe they, I saw videos too. I think they're implemented now, but that is insane. I've seen like they had uh, woman only carts as well. Yep. Yeah. That, I mean, people get like, guys get in there all the time, but they like walk somewhere else like you can enter through there but you're not like it's rude to stay in there you know everything majority of Japan is based on manners like manners and convenience like uh, all their their food items and stuff they they have like spoons inside like if I were to get like a a, a lunchable uh, like that they have the spoons already taped like on the inside of it it's super convenient and you just have to open it up throw it in the microwave and it's and their Seven Elevens dink dude it's it's like restaurant quality meals man I literally lived off of that stuff during the pandemic uh-huh. like it, it, I wish I had pictures of it but it's like. Uh, sure. It, it, they had curry bento they, they're called bento boxes they had curry bento boxes that literally felt like I was at like Coco's oh. a Coco Ichiban yeah. uh, curry dude it's amazing like the quality is nuts and then you go like 7-Eleven here you get like a chicken stick <laughs> a big chicken roller stick yeah or you go to the gas station totally to get the freaking jalapeno cheddar corn dogs yeah, yeah the old pizzas <laughs> hey that 7-Eleven pizza is fire though <laughs> that's true discredited that's true. it is dang dude I'm a big fan of it <laughs> When's the last time you had it? Oh, man. Last time I had it, I'd probably say it was a good two years ago. You should, you should go feel nostalgic yeah. to see if it's really that good. Is it really that good? Oh, it's good. Like Personally. It's cheap. I like it. Good and cheap. Totally. totally. The price probably affects the taste. That's how it was in Japan. My, my dad had went to Japan like uh, a decade prior to me uh, being there. And he, he like, that, that's his favorite place he's ever been was Japan. Uh-huh. So when I got the orders for it to go, he was like... Ecstatic. Anyway. You got orders to go? Yeah, I was there on uh, three years. I was there for three years on shore duty. So I was first on, in Virginia uh, attached to an aircraft carrier. Um, I was a diesel mechanic for the Navy. And uh, I was there for three and a half years. It was a new It was a new aircraft carrier. So we weren't like, we didn't get deployed, but we went out like all the time. We went out like every, uh, there was a point in like 2017 where we went out two weeks out, two weeks in for like nine months straight. Yeah, it sucked ass. Um, and it was like, we weren't even going out to ports. So if you get deployed, you go to like ports and stuff and you see cool shit. Like I could have gone to Italy or like Brazil or something. Yeah. Nope. We were testing the, the ship because it was new. So we just went 500 miles out of Virginia, went back in every single, every single time. So I wouldn't hit a port. I would just come back home. It sucked ass. But. And is Japan a place you always wanted to visit? 
prior to joining the, joining the Navy? At the time, no, no. Prior, I, it hadn't even crossed my mind to go, honestly. But I was like, I was in anime. <laughs> I still like anime. Like, like, I have a freaking berserk tat right here. So I'm like, all right, I'll go. Because um, I was going to get out after Virginia. I was going to get out immediately. And I, go, I was so ready to go to college. But they said... As my, I was like six, five or six months away from getting out of the military, and my officer, my main officer, came up to me and he was like, um, "You will get these orders only if you say yes." But this is my last offer, and if you want to get out, that's okay. That's on you. You can get out. But if you say yes, you will get these orders. And he was talking about Japan, um, and I was twenty three at the time. So he was saying to me. We're offering to pay you to live in Japan at 23 years old. I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> How so, could you not? And on shore duty, too, so I wouldn't have to go out to sea. So I could literally live in Japan and see what it's like. And what does shore duty entail? Um, the same things as I would on an aircraft carrier. Not nearly as hectic and with slightly better equipment. Anyone that's in the military and hears that, they're probably laughing at me right now. But the equipment sucks shit in the military. But um, it's way more lax than being on a ship. Because the, the ship life is like on your feet 24-7. Yeah. Really? There was times where I, when I was out to sea, I would work like 18-hour days. And I would still have to go to the gym afterwards so it's like live working each day off of like four or five hours of sleep and shit it's horrible but uh shore duty it's like there, there's like a vicious cycle in the navy that like it's funny the meme's like a big buff guy and it's like uh sea duty and it's a big buff shredded dude and then like shore duty is some guys like barely fitting in his uniform because you get fat on shore duty you, you don't do shit so like all you can really do is either just go out and explore or like stay with your family and just get fat <laughs> but um yeah it's way more lax and it's like I don't know, it's, it just feels it feels like a normal job, you know? You get to go home every night, see your family, do whatever you want. And what was your dad doing there? You he, said 10 years ago. Yeah, he was uh, he was in the military too, but he I think he went on his own dime. Like, he took, uh, he took leave and he went uh, with some friends. And um, I don't remember entirely, but I know he hit, like, a bunch of cities and a bunch of spots. Um, I know he went to Tokyo. Definitely went there for, like, two or three days. I think he said he went to Osaka. He went to Hiroshima. But he, like, ever since he went, I, I always recall him talking about it every so often. Like it was his favorite place? Yeah. Like, it was amazing. Dude, uh, what a killer homie trip that would be. Dude, yes. I, I, that's what I say to everyone, too. As like, I, given the chance to go back, I probably would still go. But I don't think I'd go, like, every time given the chance, you know? Because, um... I wouldn't want to work. I wouldn't want to go there under the military. I would want to go on my own dime and have yeah. my own freedom, you know, and like know that it's like limited. Cause living there can be tough, like unless you know the language and shit. But the the experience is like once in a lifetime. I tell everyone that ever asks, like you owe it to yourself to go to Japan at least once in your life, even if it's even if it's for a weekend. Be expensive as fuck, but oh, yeah. even like, dude, at two days at least, you, you, it'll change your life. It's nuts. It's the only place I've been or I've seen um, in person that feels like another planet or feels like the future. In what way? Just like all the technology. Yeah, like, you know, uh, you, ever, you ever play Cyberpunk? Yeah. 2077? Uh, there's a place called Akihabara. It's a district in Tokyo. Do Tokyo's kind of like the IE, where, like, the IE's huge, but there's, like, San Bernardino, Upland, Fontana, Rancho. Tokyo, there's, like, it's called Tokyo, but there's, like, Shibuya, uh -huh. uh, Akihabara, like uh, Hokkaido and stuff like that. It's all 13, I think it's 13 or 15 districts. Uh-huh. Each one's different, too. It's crazy. It's like a video game. Akihabara is the gaming anime district. And, like, arcades, big, like, eight-story arcades and stuff. That's the place where it has, like, the most neon lights and stuff like that. So you'll be walking down the street. It literally looks like Night City. It's nuts, dude. Like, there's, like, neon lights on every building. And that's just Giant. in the Tokyo area. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think it's, like, uh, Akihabara's, like, got some of the tallest uh, buildings in there. So if you, like, looked at Tokyo at a distance, you're probably seeing the buildings in, in Akihabara. That's also where, like, some of the most debauchery happens, but it's fucking crazy. Like... That, that place blew my mind when I first went. And then, like, Shibuya, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift. Like, everyone knows the crossing and all that stuff. That's, like, the nightclub, like, nightlife area. Like, I remember I walked through, I walked through, I went to Shibuya one time, and it was at, like, 
10 p.m. And I was walking through and I passed a nightclub and like out front, there was literally two uh, two girls in like the spandex motorcycle suits uh-huh. and they had the helmets on and the helmets had like lights all over them, and, like the eyes like yeah. bouncing the lights around and stuff. And I was like, what the heck? And they were, they were like trying to get us to come in, me and my friends, because they're like young guys, come in, get some drinks and stuff. Spend some money. And we were like, oh, we're good, we're good. But they opened the door, dude, and there was like girls in the like stilted mech suits uh-huh. and there was like neon laser light, it's like a tool concert. It's fucking insane. It looked like a tool concert in there, just light laser lights and everything, and people dancing and stuff. And I was like, "What?" <laughs> Dude, I, I'd probably, I'd probably put Tokyo or Japan up there with as far as like the most intense nightlifes. Oh, dude, it's you know? insane! It's insane. Cause like I came from prior to that. I was in Virginia going like clubbing and stuff like that and it's like yeah that's cool but Jesus Christ I felt like I was on an alien world in in Japan man like the amount of production they have for their nightclubs and like attention grabbing Uh it's nuts it's it's you literally look like you're it's like the livelihood of the city yeah exactly yeah it's 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 the heartbeat it's nuts Shibuya. So comparing that to you said you've been in New York as well, correct? Yeah. So comparing that to New York, is Japan just as busy as New York as far as like foot foot traffic? I feel like it would be for some reason. I feel um damn, I never thought of that. That's a good question. New York is busy, but it it on like a uh if you were to look at it at like a ISO metric view from like top down, it looks like unorganized, messy, just chaotic. Japan is super organized. Like, people cross the street when you need to cross. Like, it's almost robotic. Uh-huh. It's like there's, like, automatons being run everywhere. It's crazy, dude. Um, and, like, the clean, cleanliness of it all makes it look even more like that because it's just, like, it looks like lanes of everything. It's just like an assembly line. Yeah, I think it's the same amount of chaos, just organized differently. Uh-huh. You know, mastered differently because they've been doing it for so long. And, and Japan's also an authoritarian state. So it's like, you go to work, you go home. If you're a national, you go to work, you go home, that's it. Us, we were chilling, we were just going home and like hanging out and stuff, but you could tell like they are like, they're our workforce. Well, there's like this uh, fungus or like a uh, mold, right? And they kind of put each city in a channel and the mold connected itself and that's how they built the train system because the mold did it in oh, a faster right. way, yeah. So the mold's like a, it's like a living microorganism being, and it would, it mapped out the train system for them. Yeah. It did it in a faster way, so they changed it. That's crazy. I didn't know that. That's insane. That's a nuts way to look at it. Yeah, that's pretty weird. That's awesome. It's pretty fucking dope, though. Cause dude, I, I mean, I would imagine if if anybody knows the fastest way, it's probably got to be Mother Nature, dude. Mm. You know what I mean? With the ant farms, I'm thinking of ant farms right now too. Because and then the whole life finds a way thing. Yeah, dude. It's way to the travel. That's awesome. I never, I never knew that. What about street food? You ever had any street food out there? Oh yeah, dude. Um, well, there's no like. Uh, I assume you mean like carts and like taco trucks. No, not like that. Like, or, do you know who Mikey Chen is? Uh, no. He he's just like a food guy. I watch him on YouTube. He goes to Japan all the time, and yeah. it's just like there's like this. Oh, here's a little shop in this city, and it's like the one of the best things he's ever had. Or yeah, just something in the in a small building like this size. Oh, room. dude. Dude, that is like 95% of the areas like it, this room would be like a, a, a shop it would yeah. be a store uh-huh. like I think from here to the wall over there it's like 15 feet maybe uh-huh. that's a store in and of itself that's a it's almost a super center like in Japan everything's so condensed and they know how to condense it very well that it, it, like you could pass five stores in the, pan, in the span of like 10 seconds uh-huh. it's crazy like every ramen shop I went to was probably the dining area was this size and the kitchen was right there. See, and I wouldn't even imagine those such close quarters and like restaurants and stuff yeah. being over here. The drama and the yeah. fights that would start. Because... The size of Americans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we, me and my homies, when we would go out, we had the hardest time fitting in areas and stuff because the, the seats were literally like that big. Like yeah. you would have to like condense yourself. I So I, I, I wouldn't fit anywhere. Yeah. It, it, dude, oh, dude. Yeah. You, it'd be rough for you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. Like for anyone that's over like five, eight, like it's it's pretty rough but um it's super well managed and super condensed like I, as for the street food though I did if he's talking about like stores like that and yeah. stuff like oh yeah dude it's it's amazing like I, I have had some of the best ramen and curry of my life there like it's nuts like, I'm like I'm real big into like that type of Asian food yeah so like whenever I watch that guy I just get like I guess it's kind of FOMO but like 
He's like, damn, that shit looks so good. He's like, well, it's only like four bucks American. I got all yeah. this food, like yeah. four bucks American. It's like, Dude, damn. My dad, he before I went, he was like, you better save your money. It's expensive out there. It's super expensive. And I was like, damn. I got out there. It's not expensive. It's cheap as hell. It's that it's so cheap that it accumulates so fast, you think it's expensive. <laughs> like, I, I would come home after a day out and I would find out I spent like $600. Because I was like, I was buying all this food and all this like tiny little knickknacks and stuff. And it just all accumulated into like that. And, and the, the, transposing of the money like the the currency exchange or whatever like if it's like 20,000 yen you take the last two zeros off and that's like $200 okay. so I don't really like I can't do that on the fly or I don't tend I didn't tend to at the time so I was just buying shit <laughs> and it's like it, everything is so like stimulating and eye catching that you're like I want that I want that I want that oh that's cheap I want that one. it's, like, it's kind of like when you go to Chuck E. Cheese you got all your tickets at the end yeah. you know you're not really doing the math I want that one that one that exactly one. yeah <laughs> and then you realize oh I just ran out of all my tickets yeah, <laughs> yeah. what the so, fuck you had like you you had to take all these knickknacks home like everything like all your tools and stuff. I gave a lot of it away at the end, which I was like at the when I left, I was like, damn, why did I buy half this shit? <laughs> but the navy also like moved my stuff back for me at the end of it all, so uh, I just had to get boxes for it. But I have uh, like in my room right now, I have two boxes from Japan that are full of like uh, my posters and all that stuff, that, like memorabilia from it. But um. Yeah, I did have to take it all home. But majority of what I took home I had gotten in Virginia it was like clothing and all that shit, like my computer system and all that musical gear. But that that was I did give a lot of like knickknacks and stuff that I bought away to homies. Yeah. Do they have a big yard sale culture over there? <clears throat> no. 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 I, I've never seen a yard sale. Man, <laughs> once saw yards. I feel like their yard sales would be banging. Dude, the houses are nuts. Yeah. The houses are, like, it's the same thing, condensed to super condensed. So, like, I'd say that your guys' is the, the pool area right here uh-huh. would be the main part of the house, and this would be, like, the entrance. And that's the whole house. But it's, like, three stories. Okay. So it's it's condensed uh, in an area, but it's, like, raised. The like, majority of Japan's like that. So their calves are for sure getting yeah. in that work. And they have earthquakes, too, and that's... Freaky. <laughs> you felt you felt it quite a few. Yeah, I think I've, I went through two. Uh, one of which I was uh, I was on the third story of my friend's house, okay. and like I, they're they know how to do architecture and, and to prepare for that, like earthquakes and stuff. So it's like you don't really feel it when you're like on a, a higher level like that. If you're on the ground, obviously you're like holy shit, what's going on? But I guess. Um, I went through one one time and my, my friend came up because I was sleeping. I spent the night at his house and he was like, hey, like, did you feel the earthquake last night? I was like, not at all. <laughs> and he told me the time. I was like, yeah, I was wide awake. Did not feel that. So, Were you in like the barracks or you had your own place as well? I uh, In Japan, I was in the barracks, yeah. Um, it's, uh, I think they have a name for it. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. In Japan, I was actually in the barracks, but in Virginia, I had a, a thing called a PPV. I forgot what it stands for, but... It was free, uh, free. My my paycheck paid for it, but it was my own apartment, you know. So, um, and I had like a key card that would open it up. But in Japan, I was in like straight up dorms. Basically, uh-huh. it was the dorm room. Um, that sucked because like they have a, a they had inspections, like mandatory inspection monthly inspections, and if you fa- I think if you fail it three times. If you fail it three times, you get reprimanded, and then if you fail it three times again, you go up to like get punished. Oh, right. Like I don't think you, they, I don't think they'd kick you out. I don't remember if you'd ever get kicked out, but it would be like going to that level, you know, like at that level of punishment. Like you're gonna get fucked up. Well, what would you like? How could you fail something like that? Uh, dust. I, I I failed multiple because some like a shelf was dusty. I I think I think you're allowed. Uh, I think you're allowed like three failures in the span of like four months or something like that. Um, it's been like three years since I've been through one, so I don't really remember. But and these are just there's one thing you're done. Uh, no, there, there's like a list. You get I think you get three strikes. Oh okay. But um, like if you left like a, a like if a sock was hanging out of a drawer, done. Would they tell you when? Yeah, yeah. They, well, they would at least 
the beginning when I first got there, they would be like, this week, you're getting an inspection. So like for a week straight, I would be on my shit. Like every single time before I leave my room, I'd like check a million things. Um, and then I would come home to like a slip on my desk or something. And I would be like, oh, they, they did it and I passed or I failed. Um, I never got, I never failed so much that I got sent up or anything like that. But um, I did fail a lot. Cause it's just I feel like so everyone easy. did. Oh yeah, it yeah. happened all the time. It's so easy to fail because it's the military. They're super strict, and the people doing the the uh, inspections are your bosses. They're fucking assholes. <laughs> I hated all my bosses. Every single boss I had was a fucking asshole. You, you been in Virginia? Oh yeah, dude. Especially all seven years, every single boss I had was an asshole. There were some that were less assholes than others. Eighty percent of them were fucking major assholes. And I tell people all the time I hated the military, but I miss the people. I miss the friends I made and like all the people I worked. The majority of the people I worked with, besides my fucking bosses, I miss them to death, dude. They're they're awesome. I I won't. I don't think I'll ever experience a camaraderie like that again, because it's so like. Unique. Yeah, it's just weird. You're locked in a metal tube. You're so with close people. together, too. Yeah. yeah, like you see people every day. Like, I don't know. I, I, I mean, hardcore gets pretty close. Like, yeah. DIY hardcore and shit gets pretty close. I love everyone I've met in hardcore to death, and I, and I would never change anything for the world. But it's like, it's two separate separate types of camaraderie, both of which are amazing. and But one of which I'll never experience again, unless I go back in, which I'm not. Not, not happening. But, um,. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, the bosses sucked. They always sucked, and like it's it's kind of like I get it. I get why they sucked. They were forced to suck because their bosses uh. suck, <laughs> and it's just a whole chain of command thing. Like every like the CEO is pressured by so and so, and so that pressure just drops out. It, it's trickle down system. All the pressure is just accumulating, and it was a major problem in the military that like just they don't know how they don't know how to like manage shit without being assholes uh, you know and it's still a problem to this day and they even had like they would everyone knew about it even the higher ups oh yeah and, and like they have like they have like uh, seminars and shit on it but it doesn't change anything it comes from the inside it's like it's like the Stanford project that sounds familiar what is that it's like uh, they got a group of college kids Half of them were locked in jail and half of them were the wardens and they just treated them like yes. shit. Yeah, yeah, the power yeah, trip yeah. experiment. It's similar to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know what you mean. Um, it is very power trippy because like I would have people that um, I would work with and then like they would go up for a, a promotion basically and they would end up being my boss and then just turn into Turns you an asshole. And I was like, damn, you were cool a fucking week ago. But then there was people that... I was homies with and they got to that position and they they knew what it was like before so they were like I'm not fucking doing that and they would get shit like one of my one of my best friends I made in there in the military his name was uh, Anthony Sherman and I'm gonna send him this too uh, once he comes out but he was fucking awesome he eventually there was a point where he became my boss and uh he was such a like a guy who didn't take any shit. Like <laughs> it was scary at times. Like he would he would tell our bosses to fuck off, and I would be like, I think I'm gonna see him get sent up next week. <laughs> but he never did. He never got sent up. He was a big motherfucker. He was one of the reasons I got into like powerlifting and shit. Huge motherfucker, and he never never turned into one of those people. And uh, it was very rare that I ran into somebody like that, that I ever had, like, that I had friends that would get to that level and not be like that. Like, it was him and, like, a couple other people. But he was the one I remember the most because he literally would tell our bosses, like, fuck you, I'm not doing that, uh-huh. you know? Like, it's just, like, they would tell us bullshit, like, work would be over, and then we'd be, like, heading to our cars, and be like, hey, you guys forgot to sweep or something like that, uh-huh. or something small and stupid. And he'd be like, you guys go. This is fucking stupid. And he'd, like, send us out, and he would handle on the flock. So I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Just a good guy? Yeah, yeah, great guy. Amazing guy. And I still talk to him. He was not going to get eaten. He was going to do the eating. Exactly, yeah. And, like, that was a, it's a very, it was very rare that you ran into somebody like that in the military. Because the military is super, like... Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that like suck up to the higher uh, command and stuff like that, but um, I don't know. It, it was really awesome when you ran into somebody that didn't and did shit like that. It's like stood stood up for the the lesser the lesser crowd. Do you keep in close contact with anyone that was in the military? I keep close contact with him, the guy I just told you about. 
he uh, we talk about like lifting and stuff still and all shit. He's like he's going through like USPA powerlifting right now. I've been talking to him about that. He's fucking kicking ass. Um, other than that, there's another guy I talk to, uh, but it's like very rarely. Uh-huh. Like we play video games every once in a while. Um, but I think the last time I talked to him was like two months ago. But I don't know. Um, which is like the polar opposite from my dad. My dad knows like the guy, the first guy he ever met in boot camp. He still talks to him. I'm like, what the fuck? That's crazy. But I don't know. I I, I feel like my and everyone has a different time. Like when they go in, they and some people enjoy the hell of it and they stay for the rest of their lives. Some people get out and they hated it. I I didn't like it uh, at all. But I it's like I said, I wouldn't in a million lifetimes if I was given the choice, I would do it every single time because it it. Not only the camaraderie is amazing, and I, I'm so glad I experienced that. And also, I wouldn't be able to do majority of what I'm doing today without the without military's help. You know, like my, I'm going through school with them, and I'm like getting paid by the military and all that stuff. Like, it, it's helped a lot. Just giving credit where credit's due. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and that's a, that's the that thing is like we we used your body, we used your time, and like we took your age from you. And we're gonna like give back to you for your time out like, and all that stuff but yeah I, I feel like I feel like I do talk to somebody else I just can't think of it right now but I, I mostly just remember him I remember you mentioned you were a decent mechanic right yeah yeah so <laughs> it sucks cause like I was a diesel mechanic but none of it is transferable to the civilian world <sighs> Cause it's well besides like oil changes uh-huh. and like basic shit like changing a tire, like or, even back then you still had the big ass truck in you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. In the heart. yeah. Do you I, have Do you have a big ass uh, truck right now? Huh? Do you, Do you drive a big ass truck? I drive one to shows. <laughs> nah, dude, my daily is a sedan, brother. Nah, I, I, I the big ass truck I get fucking flipped off every single day and shit yeah. like that. But big, the big ass truck's in here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Baby. But um, I, I like I got homies that would come up to me like, "What are you gonna do if somebody comes up to you and like, you're not even blue collar?" I'm like, "Motherfucker, I was a diesel mechanic for almost a decade. Like, <laughs> I served my time." <laughs> and like everyone in that band is like blue collar. Uh-huh. Like they've done their shit. Yeah, like yeah, I, I always get people coming up to me like what are you gonna do if like no we're all good like we're checked out <laughs> I remember because uh, Sergio had just said oh Abel wants to come on your show and for me I'm maybe holder too but I don't really know anyone in hardcore and I was yeah. like I, I need his at I need his at yeah. and then uh, we started talking and then we saw you at that show in Long Beach yeah. and I told Holder I was like now I get what the corn fed comes from <laughs> dude you're massive oh dude. yeah you're we, a unit boy, dude. dude he's a power lifter <laughs> I, I, I was I was a power lifter for like three years like three-ish years uh, I, I trickled I mean I still lift pretty heavy nowadays but it's not nearly as what I was doing when I was power lifting yeah we so. call you like a, a Tom Hardy build the tank that's what we call you <laughs> Just a That's unit, awesome. just a unit. <laughs> Dude, were you pretty competitive when you got into powerlifting? I did, uh, yeah, I did a comp. I did one competition. Uh, it was in Virginia, and it was uh, drug tested USPA or USAPL. Um, and I did. Uh, uh, there's like different types of powerlifting, which is like you can do wrapped, you can do non wrapped, and non wrapped is like people wear the the leg sleeves, uh-huh. and that's like the most you can do. Um, but wrapped is that like have you? I, I don't know how much you go to the gym I mean your gym equipment was here but you ever see the guys wrapping their legs in those yeah yeah the bandages uh-huh. like yeah, the, they're like they're tight really, super tight really, yeah the long yeah. ones that so when I was powerlifting I I was a pissed off motherfucker and that because I was in the military and I was on a ship so I was getting treated like shit every single day and I was just angry every single day so I would utilize that into my powerlifting and uh, I've archived all the videos on my Instagram but I have a bunch of videos of me like doing like 500 pound squats 600 pound deadlifts and shit and I'm just like like pissed off though you could see it in my face it's what, what music was going through the ears oh brother when every single video of those I was on it was a I worked out at a powerlifting gym uh-huh. and the thing with powerlifting gyms is they're not commercial gyms yeah. the motherfucker that, that owned the gym he, he was my best friend at the time and he was also my coach and his the, the PA the, the, the sound system there was just a big ass PA uh-huh. anyone could, could, could connect to it so I was on there playing like sanction vein and shit and I would just like hit a heavy lift like I to this day I can't hit a heavy lift like a scary lift that I know is gonna like 
hurt like a motherfucker unless I'm blasting like something in my ears. Like my go-to deadlift song if I'm doing like a PR is Doom Tech from Vane. Like, and I skip to the chorus. I'm like, okay, let's go. Like, it's because of my time at that powerlifting gym. Because every time I would do a heavy lift, my coach would be like, what do you want on? What do you want to play? Because he understood that every lifter is different. And for me, music was my thing. Like, I needed good, like, heavy, angry music angry to music. get through this lift. Um, but yeah, no, it was like hardcore metalcore shit playing every single time I was lifting. Dude, like, and I don't understand how people do, how people go to the gym with without music oh dude it, it's every time like two weeks ago I forgot my headphones and I just drove home <laughs> I'm not fucking I'm not doing this today I'm not doing this I'm not fucking doing that yeah I, uh, Jacob uh, big ass truck guitarist um, he started working out with me recently and there was one time he came and we went to the gym and I found out I forgot my airpods and I was just losing my mind on the bike just like pedaling because I was talking to him during the lifts but I was just alone on the bike and I was like oh my fucking god I put on a nail set and I couldn't even hear it <laughs> it was like nails this is hardcore and I was just watching people stage dive <laughs> that's funny though because that's like what I do I just put on a 197 video and yeah. usually like about a half hour I'm like perfect on Stairmaster exactly once it's done <laughs> I'm done yeah. dude I always watch uh, the 197 of uh, Vane at 1720 that's one of my running yeah, check ones. that out yeah dude it's an awesome set I think it was like 2019 or something like that but that shit is insane my go to set is uh, Terror for the Children of uh, 2022 I think it was yeah, yeah, that was awesome. <clears throat> I like my go to. My go, like my. If I'm trying to get this, this goes beyond the gym too. If I'm trying to get inspired in general, my go-to set. And this is me and uh, Angel from Worthy Buena. We talk about this set all the fucking time. The Vein. This is hardcore 2018 set. Have you seen it with the red lights? Nope. No. Dude, look at the mental notes right now. Dude, I'll, I'll write it down for you and shit. I'll send it to you afterwards. It's it's entirely red lights the whole time. And this was like peak Vein when Arizona was like blowing them up. Um. And they, they start with fucking they start with their song End Eternal. And to this day I've never heard them play that song live again, never seen a video with them playing that song live again. And it, it just blows my mind how hyped the crowd is. Like I don't know how that stage held that the hell all those people up. And like it's funny that you say it because like all my homies have sets like that uh -huh. their go-to set and like that their go-to like hey five six their go-to one and seven and shit like like our homie chris uh chris root that's not his last name but he, we call him chris root because there's a whole story behind it but he's uh he's also in ruin yes he's the other guitarist uh -huh. of ruin not sergio um he he told me that uh and this might have changed by now but his, his go-to at the time when i was talking to him was uh sanctions this is hardcore where there there was like theirs was like green lights so i was like oh dude we got red light go-to yeah. set you got a green light go-to set <laughs> was sanction the one that was playing jazz yes oh, yeah, dude, so so oh you guys went that's right yeah. i'm so jealous of you dude i want to see sanction so bad it was amazing we saw a lot of big ass trucks on that road over there <laughs> <laughs> God, i can't believe you guys did that drive that's oh. so I, I i'm flying every time i'm never driving hey man yeah, i don't think i'd do it again we sure as hell tried to fly that's for sure i drove cross country one time no 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. I drove cross country one time when I got uh, my orders for Japan. I went from Virginia to California because um, I was like going on leave before I was gone for three years. Jesus fucking Christ. I don't know how I did that. And I also, I fucked up on moving my stuff out of my house uh, uh, in Virginia. So I had to carry everything that I owned, everything that I accumulated in Virginia in my, in my sedan. Fuck. Yeah, that car that's out there, I had to put it all in there. So I literally, if I had to take a break and take a nap on the road, I was sleeping sitting up. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, but you're used to it already. Yeah. The military. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the time, I was like, yeah. Well, this is comfortable. Yeah. I literally, like, I've fallen asleep standing up in the military and shit. I was like, or leaning up against the wall. Uh -huh. Um... But yeah, no, I was, I was pretty good. But, dude, if I had to do that nowadays, I would die. <laughs> the thing was is that uh, our break time was... Hey, I'm tired. I'm done driving, and then we switch, and we'd be napping or whatever. Yeah. I had a great time. It was a great time. Oh, dude, that's a that's a experience fun. you keep for life. It was totally awesome. Yeah, we did crash there at the end. That was fun. You crashed? Yeah. Like we hit some black ice in Arizona. What in Arizona of all it places? Was crazy. So 
whenever there's like someone pulled over on the side of the caution lights, it's common courtesy to pull over to the other to the next lane. Okay. So I was going. There was a cop with his lights on. So I moved over, and right when I moved over, hit black ice, and we went right to the ditch, like 15 feet from the cop. And he helped us out, and we got out. And he said, just go ahead and pull over. Was he there because of the black ice? There was a car in there with no one in it. Uh, so someone had crashed in there before us. Damn. And uh, we went to the gas station. We checked it out. I was like, yeah, she's got some scratches on the car. Chilling. Yeah. But yeah, uh, took us like 32 hours each way. Straight. So wait, was that? Stops. That was on the way back. To on the way back, yeah. Oh. So on the way in, I was like, yo, it's snow. This is badass. <laughs> and then on the way back, you're like, oh, fuck. Oh, <laughs> this is badass. Yeah, but he, he was asleep. And I remember there was like a piles of snow like like this high, like maybe five yeah. feet high. And I was just like amazed. And then it would like open up into a canyon of just pure white. And it was a full moon. So it was just like bright white. Was that your first time seeing snow? No. Okay. But it was it was something that I've never seen like that before to experience it for so many hours, like four or five hours at a time. Mm-hmm. But it was like daytime at night because of the 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 moon's reflection off the snow. It was awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I I'm, I mean I was well familiar with snow <laughs> by the time I hit Virginia. But Cause of, oh, cause Virginia's cold as fuck, isn't oh, it? Oh my fucking god, bro! Yeah, it's, cool. it was, the coast is just a yeah. giant snowball. Japan was colder, but Virginia's cold as fuck. <laughs> so like, where where you're stationed, Japan is, like, isn't it? Doesn't it get below freezing sometimes? Uh, when I was there. I think the lowest it ever got when I was there was like nine degrees, eight, eight nine degrees. Um, that was in Japan. Yeah. That's fucking oh freezing. My God. Yeah, it was ridiculous. But that's also in like certain areas, you know, because I mean we're next to the ocean, so that where I was, I was uh, ten miles away from Tokyo, mm-hmm. which is like uh, like a forty minute drive in Japan because it's so fucking condensed, but. I was attached to a base which is connected to the ocean, so the ocean breeze. I guess. During the winter? Chilly. Oh my god, bro. I had yeah, like six blankets in my, in my fucking room, man. That shit sucked. My dad told me that he when he went to Chicago one time, it was like below freezing. Chicago's cold as fuck. And he said that he couldn't breathe Yeah. the air because it would hurt his lungs. Oh, dude, fuck like, that. I've never... I wouldn't even, couldn't even imagine something that cold. Dude, Chicago, Chicago is where the Navy boot camp is. So I was there for three months. Oh, fuck. Man, imagine, imagine people with asthma. Imagine the people with asthma. Fuck, dude. Dying out there. They ain't got asthma no more because they don't, they don't live anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get back to Ashiki. Yeah. Me and Hose were talking about this outside before you got here. Mm-hmm. I don't know, like, I'm sure there's an actual name for it, but, like, you guys have these awesome fucking intros, like, audios. The, sam- the samples. Oh, the samples. Yeah, they're fucking stuff. awesome. Yeah. Dude, who finds them? Um, so the, the ones on the EP, they're, uh, I made them. Okay. They're my voice. That's me. I just, like, Transpose, transpose, auto tune, craziness. You know, I make it sound. I made it sound like a robot for that one. Um, and the ones on the album, those are from movies. Like a good majority of them are from movies. Like the last song, the title track. Um, the, it starts off with like a bunch of chugs, like drr, drr, and then there's like a playback in between the chugs. That's Ultron, and I like transposed That's it. That's awesome. And I put like auto tune over and stuff, and it, it was just him being like disgusted with like how he's being treated or how he was being treated when he was an AI and stuff like that. And then uh, I, th- I think I have uh, Ultron on there. I have Ex Machina on there, and. Uh, I want to say another Blade Runner. Yeah, I have, I have the original Blade Runner on there. Like uh, that was that was majority movies, but the EP was all like me basically, just me or me talking to myself. That's awesome because like, every time I hear it's like every time I hear a song, it's like, dude, that sample was fucking awesome. Yeah. It just it feels like it fits yeah. perfect yeah. for the song. Oh, I'm sorry, Anomaly is from Blade Runner. Okay. Yeah, Anomaly's intro playback. That's Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Uh, that's the baseline test, which is like that. I can directly, um, I can directly, uh, for lack of a better word, blame the baseline test scene for creating a shiki, because the whole idea behind the baseline test is uh, the replicants or whatever they get a baseline test after every mission to see if they're still just a dead like deadhead robot. Uh-huh. So they ask all these like thought provoking questions like, um, do they keep you in a box when you're not at work? Do uh, have you ever felt the hand of a lover? Have you ever felt the breath of a, of a child? Uh-huh. And it's like if it if it's like straight faced and like doesn't do anything or if it even twitches or something, they're like, 
kill it. Oh, shit. It's like gaining sentience. So I was like, oh, shit, that's badass. And so, I made a whole thing about it. So I know the theme of the whole album is kind of like AI, you know, realizing itself. Like and free will AI and something. So is that something that you kind of have a fear of or is that something you think about a lot? I feel like I like subconsciously subverted it to, uh, it was like kind of like an outlet for me because I felt like I was locked in place with the military. I fucking, I hated my life in the military outside of hanging out with the people that I loved in it because I, I literally felt like a rat trapped in a cage and I, I, maybe I was like repressing it or something but when I made because I made that the beginning EP the white one I made that in my room in Japan during lockdown and because uh, I was losing my mind so it like subconsciously just melded into the story in the lyrics like it, it, the, the entire story of that that concept EP is about realizing realizing you're a servant getting out and living to your best potential yeah but I gave it a dark ending whereas like uh, in AI in the original EP for AI he like realizes like no matter where he goes he's gonna be subverted to somebody's will so he's just like fuck it he just offs himself or do all like do all the members of Ishiki also understand like that first project that you did with it uh, they get they get its significance to me. Uh, I, I I feel like they're mostly there for breakdowns. <laughs> so, but, so, like, so. I, all, sorry, just uh, to finish this off, but I we've all agreed. Like I am, that's my baby. Like I love the, how that EP came out. If I were to redo it, I would get a producer or something. But. Could you I remaster it? Huh? Would you ever get it remastered? Oh, we we remastered, we, remastered, we remastered it. That was the most recent one. Like you probably heard the brown one that okay. brown yes. EP. Uh-huh. There's one before it that uh, I dropped in 2021. That was the one I made in my room. The one, the brown one, was made by Matt Manny. He produced it, engineered it, and everything. We just re-recorded all the parts and everything like that. And Kevin did his drums over it. Um, but I don't I told the guys and we've all agreed like I love that EP to death and I'll hold it with me for the rest of my life but I don't want to go that route anymore of like robots you know like we're we're, we're kind of done being the robot band we just want to like now we just want to be technical and like do like crazy mosh parts and shit super heavy beat down yeah yeah like just beat down ass breakdowns with like crazy technical in betweens you know so like the new stuff we're doing is fucking nuts awesome like, there's all kinds of off time shit and like all that stuff so we're, we're trying to go that route but yeah I, they 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 get its significance but they're they're there to write music they're de- they're there to make people mosh you know so that's what they love yeah yeah i'm, I'm 100 okay with that i want their input on everything and, and obviously you got big ass truck and ishiki right yeah. and so what it sounded like um, you are a big ass truck in a sense. you're a fucking unit right? i'm the big ass truck but it, sa- it sounds <laughs> it's, like it's ishiki is more you that is i literally have told every member that's been in ishiki that like just the fact that you're doing this project with me like you i will i'm indebted to you because this is a piece of me when i made that shit i was going through a lot of shit so i was like just the fact that you're helping me bring it to other people and like bring it live is amazing and i think it's just going to make me appreciate it so much more yes now that i know like what it's all about like brother i've that i've put so much into ishiki like i was living in san diego for the first two years of ishiki's show life so if i needed to practice i would drive two hours to i and it, it would just be like a two worth it to you oh yeah and the entire um lp every time i re- caesar we did it with caesar he lives in highland yeah. so i would drive i would drive from el cajon all the way to highland just to record for like three hours drive back home for like two years straight, every weekend, I would do that. And that's totally a grind right there. It, yeah. That's a totally grind. I would do it a million times over. I, 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 even if I was living there today, I would still drive to Manny's and like record what we're recording now. Like, I love that thing to death. I, and I've told, I've told, um, I've told everyone that's in it, like, I don't care if Ishiki blows up. I just want to play crazy shows with it and make the music that makes us happy. Hell Which yeah. is like ideal for us, at least for, for all the members. We're like, we're just there to have fun. And I remember like, uh, like, I'm sure you heard, but, like, we're only, well, me personally, I've been in hardcore for, like, a little over a year now. And I remember... I'm jealous of you, for, by the way, for that. Why? Because I wish, I wish I could go through, uh, I wish I could redo it all. You know, like, experiencing shows like this and shit like that. Fucking LDB for the first time must have blown your mind, bro. It was awesome. That shit's insane. A, a yeah. fucking room 
packed with thousands of people. It was just, yeah. it was awesome. Dude, like seeing like Sanction or like the, the King Nine set, that's like all people were talking about was the King Nine set after. Dude, and we're so lucky to have some the size of Sound and Fury here in California. Yeah. yeah you know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. And obviously it's going to be different bands and all that mm-hmm. stuff, but it's just the sheer crowd alone is just a marvel in itself. That was another big regret, big regret of mine was uh, I didn't go to Sound and Fury until 2023, mm-hmm. um, but I, I was going to local shows and stuff uh, from 2013 to 2015, but I just... Uh, I. I regret not absorbing more information. At the time, I was an ignorant teenager, and I was just like, hey, shows, let's just go hang out and like watch people mosh, mosh ourselves or something like that. I didn't absorb who I was seeing. Like The only bands I really remember from back then were like Goliath, Sleeping Giant, um, uh, Set Your Anchor and stuff yeah. like that. And like all those members and stuff have gone on to do other things and all that stuff that are like big now. And, or like even people like I, I know, like I, uh, I think Cameron from uh, Cold View, the drummer, he was in Set Your Anchor. Uh-huh. Like I know him now. I'm like, holy shit. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really regret not absorbing information from there, not going to bigger stuff like Sound and Fury and stuff like that. And uh, but now I'm like, I feel like I'm making up. Time. Lost time, yeah. yeah, you know, but like I, I'll fucking go to any show nowadays. Like I, I'm going to shows like crazy. Like I think like next Saturday, this Saturday, uh, as this is being recorded, I want to go to the Ruin Provoke. We will be there as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I want to go to that so bad. I'm, I want to ask one of them if they can get me a ride, but I'm I'm not, I'm not stressing either way. I really want to go to that. I, I always love seeing Provoke and Ruin. They're amazing. Um, what, what what do they call them? Ruin Vogue. Ruin Vogue. Yeah. Or, yeah. Ruin Vogue. That's so funny. The, the team band. That, that was us and Marte Bana. That was like our sister band was Marte Bana. I was going to ask you about that. Like, uh, I know it was like the last show. What happened with that? You guys just getting too busy? With Marte Bana? Yeah. So I, I know I played bass, but I, I wasn't a member. Okay. I was a last minute uh, like add-on because uh, Chris, Chris Root... Um, he was they went through like a cycle of bassists the first bassist ever was Andrew Vargas that was a friend that they met met in high school water polo he played with them for like a year long lost cousin yeah, yeah. long lost huh? cousin long huh? lost cousin right there <laughs> I'm Vargas that's why yeah, I was a Vargas yeah. okay <laughs> that makes sense but um he was a first bassist year and a half I think with them and then he left, and my bassist at the time, uh, his name was Alex, he filled in for them for like a bunch of shows, uh-huh. like, I wanna say like 10 shows or something like that. And then uh, I had I eventually kicked him out of Ashiki because it was just, it, it was a whole thing. It was just really stressful in the band and just, he was going through a lot of stuff that I won't say for his own personal reasons, but I was like, you you should focus on your life before the band because it's only going to weigh down on the band and weigh down on yourself, and you're gonna be in you're gonna end up in a spot that's gonna take yeah. years to repair uh-huh. before like anything before you're even able to work with us anymore. So, and at the time I was like considering. Um, bringing him back in down the line but it was like a hard cut after that so but um so he did those shows with them and after that they went with Caesar uh who's now the guitarist of Ashiki and guitarist of Smoke he he filled in with them for like I think around the same amount of shows yeah and uh I I want to say he did the tour I want to say he did the tour with them and then um Chris was after Caesar because Chris, Chris was in the uh, band Atrocitus okay. for a little bit, and then that band like I don't know they defunct or something. Actually, I think they're still playing shows, but um, they like disbanded uh, for a little bit. So he went to Morte Buena for a bit, and then uh, yeah, that was like the latter half of last year, and then around October, <clears throat> they called it, and. They, they had already been working on music for like almost a year and um, so they were like alright we'll drop this and then we'll like That's see it. about a last show or something and um, that that show last Saturday wasn't originally going to be Morte Bana's last show well they were still going to have their last show but it was going to be Rebirth Fest too uh-huh. uh, things got in the way planning and all that stuff so it was, it was and also there was like a bunch of felt like Sound of Furies around the corner Mosh for Youth just happened. It would have been uh, like less than ideal, dude. And it's crazy that you got to fill in at that show because what a killer show it was. I was telling him too, like, 
I love every single member of Marte Buena to death. The, the drummer is my cousin. Okay. So that's how I knew about Marte Buena. And like when I was in the military and I found out he was getting into hardcore, I was like, yes, let's fucking go. Because I was in a band in 2013 to 2015. I was like, let's fucking go, dude. That's awesome. And I would like message him all the time. Like, dude, send me more of your band, man. Like, I'm going to get out there. I want to start writing music again and shit. So the first show I ever went, the first local show I ever went um, to back from uh, uh, the military like I got out I got back to California in January 2022 it was Muerte Buena at a skate park in Chino Hills and <laughs> it was like I think Atrocitus threw it because they were friends with Atrocitus at the time and like they got them on and they had like one of these lights there and that's all it was only facing the band you couldn't see shit oh, dude, they should have had it facing out yeah exactly because the, the skate park lights they were automated so you couldn't turn them on after like 9 p.m so Morte Buena went on at like 9 10 9 15 or something pitch black like mosh area and i was like i'm not fucking getting near that so i was behind them the whole time just like yeah <laughs> but that was the first local local gig i got to um was Marte Buena and that was like the first I think I saw a band right before them but they were the ones I remember the most because like I was just blown away that I was watching my cousin that yeah. I saw I held as a baby watching him drum and play like breakdowns and shit I was like let's fucking go dude so the, the, it was like super cathartic that I I saw them as a guy getting back into hardcore uh, so later in life and then I'm playing their last show I'm like putting them to rest you know it was like all night I was like trying to hold in tears especially during that set like fucking just God, like, that was a fucking night for you too dude any back and the, forth oh yeah dude that too yeah it, it was uh, it's fucking it was so taxing I slept until like 2pm the next day it was insane valid very um, valid it was funny it was like after that show I got fucking food with Sergio and we talked for like four hours after what happened to your Del Taco dude I ate it. <laughs> I ate it, dude. Yeah, yeah. Your daughter did great. She and she watched the Del Taco, man. Yeah, That's yeah. awesome. Uh, we're sitting at the table, and he was like, "You know, my Del Taco was on the table." Yeah, yeah. He was like, "Please watch my Del Taco." Yeah. And, she, uh, and then he was like, "Can you watch my Del Taco to the baby?" Yeah. And then she was like, <laughs> "And then I was like, dude, I gotta go." <laughs> yeah. I was looking for you to hand it to you, but then yeah, I, sure. I I got sidetracked, and then uh, I was like, "I gotta go." And I saw him posting a yeah. story. He was like. Me, because I forgot my fucking Del Taco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, man, but how often, how often is somebody random just picking up a random bag of food? I guarantee exactly. it's all the time. Exactly. You think so? There's some weird motherfuckers out there, man. So so my, my thought process with it was... I Okay, people, like my friends, hate this about me, but I'll eat fucking anything. Because uh, You were in the Navy. You were in the Navy. You get it. You yeah. get it. I'm sure your dad's told you he's eating some bullshit. The MREs... Yeah, hold on. My dad loves them. Dude, yeah. He fucking, like, uh, there's a military surplus store in, like, Pomona. Yeah. He'd take me there all the time to get MREs. I mean, Dude, I, I don't think they're that bad. I don't think they're amazing, but I've he loves them. I don't taste, but they, once, uh, any Marine that I know will eat those motherfuckers Fuck. daily. They'll eat them daily. Like. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm with my dad. Yeah. yeah. So, He's just so used to it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't personally. I had an MRE before, but I I didn't eat those as daily. I had a I had a galley yeah, on the yeah, ship, yeah. so I would go there. But um, all the food was bullshit, dude. Like it was the, our eggs were literally powdered, like it was a powder. The scrambled eggs were a powder they throw oh, yeah. in and hot water and mix it together. That's a scrambled egg. That is true. Do better? Sounds bad. Sounds bad. Sounds bad. I would eat another plate if it was right here right now, dude. That shit was good. <laughs> it was good. It was good, and I I feel like it was only good. Because of the shit they put me through, you know? Like, I would be up for, like, fucking 19 hours or something like that, but I'm like, hey, breakfast is right here. Let's fucking go. <laughs> like, that would be the thing I would look forward to the next day. Weren't you required, yeah. like, three meals a day? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yes. By law, you are required three meals a day, but your chain of command doesn't give a fuck. They'll fucking, they'll, they, like, keep I've working. missed meals every week. I missed wheel, meals because I had to do something. But, um... Was it because of the area you were in, or is it because of just it's just the general? military? Yeah. Just the military. They, they, they like they on on paper on an outside view. Of military is like a hey, mental health, a hey, take care of our workers, a a a. But if you're in the military, they're like, do this shit right now. I don't give a fuck. Like it's it, it's very much like that. But I mean, 
it's it's super acquired taste and whatnot, you know. I don't know how motherfuckers stay in for life. And it was funny. I was telling my dad when I was joining. I was like, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be just like you. I'm gonna do twenty. I'm gonna do twenty years, and I'm gonna get out and requ- retire at like forty. Uh-huh. And I'm gonna be fucking de- fucking like a year in. I was like, this is retarded. <laughs> how the hell did you do this for twenty years, dude? But he was also a submariner, which is wildly different uh-huh. to an aircraft okay. carrier. Because on an aircraft carrier, I worked with five thousand people, and I, that wasn't even max occupancy. My max occupancy was an aircraft carrier at like, because it wasn't a full working ship. It was new. We were still testing it. I think max occupancy was like 7,000. That's like with Marines on board and everything, like fully, fully everything. Um, his, on a submarine, averaged 150. See, but you're talking about being in a box. Metal tin. That yeah. is scary for one, and some you're in there for shit. months at a time, aren't you? There's some creepy shit that happens, man. Like, like I'd much rather be on an aircraft carrier. Really? Oh yeah, than a submarine. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's understandable. That's usually the vibe that people get. Well, like, aren't like, like in a submarine? Aren't you like in the water, like off the off the port for months you're before you come back? You're typically underwater for like. I think my dad told me the longest he was under, under underwater was like 32 days. Wow! Oh, like, wow! Yeah, and like it's dude. One of the coolest things, well, creepy and cool that he told me was like. Uh, okay, it was cool and, and more morbid how morbid it is. But he said he cut his arm one time, uh, not on purpose. Like he got he hit something and it cut his arm, and it took. Uh, it took like two weeks for it to scab over because there's no sunlight. There's no vitamin D. There's like, you have to take like multivitamins and shit. And so his body wasn't healing at the rate that it's supposed to. Yeah. So when you're like, when you're underwater, there's a lot of shit that changes. <laughs> it's, it's an entirely different breed of human that needs to go under there. But I was supposed to be a submariner, but I got medically disqualified because uh, I had a kidney stone at 17. So they saw my medical records when they did their background Even check. Even a kidney me. stone just like shot you down? Yeah, because they're, 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 um, their thought process is uh, if you're underwater for 30 days and you get a kidney stone and you need to be medevaced out, they're not going to pay a million dollars to medevac one guy out. You know, like if I need an invasive surgery, they're, they're like, no. So even if you had one before, even if you're not prone to them, you're disqualified. So I wasn't prone to them. I was just drinking a shit ton of Baja Blast. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking got a kidney stone. And uh, yeah, they, they were like, no, you can't do it. So they disqualified me and shit. And, but at the time, it was so sick. I, I love the fact that my dad was in for 20 because his, his, I found out that uh, I was going through the, the background check at medical. And like this guy pulls me aside and like, follow me I was like oh fuck (laughs) this was out of the ordinary because I was supposed to go to another room with another doctor who was my actual doctor he was looking into me and he was like follow me he was a big motherfucker too he was like kind of (laughs) jacked his his name was Minky and um, he takes me to a side room that's literally like half of this room and there's only a table a, a shut off computer and a fucking landline like a, 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 a shitty old telephone. just nothing yeah just a shitty old telephone he's like he sees like take a seat he sits down like this he's like you know why you're here and I was just like no what's what's going on I'm like 19 I'm like no am I in trouble like what do I do he's like I'm your cousin I'm like what yeah. <laughs> I was like you're my fucking cousin he's like yeah man I know your dad you want to call your dad uh, we're not allowed to talk to our parents for three months so him offering that to me I was like let's fucking go I was like hell yeah I want to talk to my dad and so I called my dad and that's fun and I talked to him for like 10 minutes did he had already set that up with your dad yeah, my dad. My dad texted him prior too, and he was like, "Hey, if you if you see this guy coming through, get him. Like, let me talk to him." Or something like that. Yo, hell yeah, that's sick. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I don't uh, know, see. Sorry to my dad. Uh, I know he was an engineer. Your dad? Yeah, and I don't know if you, but uh, right there is the F twenty two on the wall. Yeah. He designed the engine for the F twenty two. Holy shit! So I don't know how long he and he he also worked at NASA too on the space shuttle, the first space shuttle. That's I don't know how many years he was in the military. Yeah. But I know that he was a uh, fuck. He's gonna. Kill. You know what time frame he was in? Desert Storm. So oh. I know that he's gonna kill me right now. I don't know if he was an E eight or E nine. <laughs> I know yeah. he's, as soon as he sees yeah, this sergeant, he's, he's, he's yeah. gonna fucking tell me him. he's gonna rip me a new one I feel like uh, knowing Marine's work ethics I feel like he was an E9 getting out cause that those motherfuckers are crazy but yeah 
Some of the some of the funniest people I've he ever met. It. He loved it. I got a great Marine story for you. This shit to this day makes anyone to laugh because it, it's so stupid and it, it perfectly encapsulates how dumb the Marines are, but how awesome they are. And dumb in 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 a in a funny way. Because yeah. I mean, I've heard they call them crayon eaters, right? Yeah, yeah. They're dumb. Like uh, you ever seen Emperor's New Groove? Yes. Cronk. Yeah. Dude's dumb, but everyone loves him. It's exactly how Marine is. So. Uh, what's it called? I was I was going through A school, which is the school you go to right after boot camp, uh-huh. and it teaches you like your main job, what your main job's gonna be in the military. Because boot camp, you just learn the basics of the military and like how to like take care of your shit. Um, and majority of what boot camp is is it teaches motherfuckers that don't know how to clean themselves how to fucking do that. Like brush your teeth, go fucking take a shower, yada yada yada. And there's it's wild that there are some motherfuckers at like 21 years old that didn't know how to do that. I mean, you've been to a hardcore show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Okay, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> go to a crush show. Holy shit. But um, yeah, no. So I was I was at a school right and. <laughs> A school combines the branches, so I think like all four of them were there, but like the least amount of people that were there were like Air Force. There's like 20 of them or something like that. But most of the people that were there were Navy and Marines. So my class was full of, it was 20 people and like 12 of them were Navy and the rest were Marines. So it was like a smaller group of Marines. Um, to this day, there were some of the funniest motherfuckers I ever met and they all had inside jokes, but we somehow understood them. And there was one time where in between, uh, you would start class at like 8 Uh a.m. And at like 12, uh, you would get a 30 minute break. And around the corner was like a little, uh, like it it was basically like a liquor store. Um, But around the corner of the building was that. And like it had like the vending machines and shit like that. And uh, after that 30 minutes, you would go back in and go to class until like three or four. Yeah. Um, but there was one time, this was like in the middle of my schooling, like it's like two and a half months in. And prior to this, all the Marines are all meatheads. So they go to the gym right after school. They just fucking push their lifts to the max and shit. Just fucking testosterone junkies, you know? And all they talk about is doing like uh, uh, protein shakes and pre-workout and the big pre-workout at the time was C4 fucking C4 was blowing up all over base and it was like yo you got some C4 you got some C4 they would bring that they would drink that shit at 7am before class starts just so they could stay awake it was like their coffee all the marines so this one time after class we have our break we're going to the liquor store like area and like keep in mind it's that that liquor store area is probably as big as that little uh, yeah. uh, area right there it's like 20 feet wide at the most so there's like 30 people in there and for some reason like there wasn't a lot of talking going on it was pretty silent for like as many people as there were in that room <laughs> And one of one of the Marines, he was a fun, I forgot his name. I think his first name was Daniel. But he goes up to this guy. This guy was not nearly as much of a meathead as them. He was a little pudgy and kind of dorky. But he goes up to the vending machine, and he's like, "It's about time I see what all this C four is about." And he types in C four and gets some Cheez-Its. <laughs> And everyone at the entire at the entire liquor store like area was dying laughing. <laughs> I was like right next to him too when I saw that. I, I, just, I couldn't hold it in. I had to walk away. <laughs> that shit was hilarious. Oh, man, that's, stupid. that's in that story happened like a hundred times a week. Like just different. I'm sure he was so embarrassed, dude. Yeah. <laughs> no, he probably loved that shit. All eyes around him, he was like <laughs> laughing his ass. Were you in on the pre workout too? Uh, As a powerlifter yourself? At the time, I wasn't. But when I started powerlifting, I couldn't get through a lift without that shit. Like, it, it, it's it's what got me. Because it, it kind of hypes you up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. All you the understand. beta alanine, you yeah. get itchy. The itchy? Yeah. A lot of my friends hate the itchiness. I love the I itchiness. I love it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, me and Hoser, uh, I hate it, personally. We were kind of like interns at Nutri Shop. They had one down the street by the gym. Yeah. And every day, he's like, oh, if you guys clean the <laughs> shelf, I'll give you a free scoop, whatever you want. So every day, we'd be getting, like, insane or all this other stuff. Yeah. Any type of free work I can get my hands on. Yeah. And then I remember one day he told me, he was like, hey, they're discontinuing this this right here because people are making meth out of it. He was like, it's not FDA approved. I'm going to give you... You know what it was called? Mesomorph. It still, it still exists, that. but they changed the formula. <coughs> it would come out in clumps. Like, you'd eat it like candy. <coughs> and he's like, I'll just eat a piece like, like that, like this big. Mm-hmm. So I'd eat a piece and just be like fucking amped. And I just like... Yeah. <laughs> You totally could see how they make meth out of it. That was yeah, the strongest yeah. shit I ever took. I remember I used to have to take like 600 milligrams before the gym. That was terrible. 
That was dude, terrible. Dude, we were kids. <laughs> it was bad. How, wait, how, how old are you guys? How old are you playing the game? Uh, 24. 24? 24. 24, about 24. At, at this time, it was like early high school, like freshman, sophomore, junior year. Yeah. We would go like every fucking day together. <laughs> every day. Dude, that's like the, the peak age of like the pre-workout companies trying to get you. You know, like between like 17 to 22. Yeah. It's like, you're going to get... Oh, man, and they got us. Well, yeah. actually, you know what? Maybe we got them. Because <laughs> I, think, I think we're getting all the samples. And <laughs> we, we didn't buy a single thing. We were broke teenagers, you know? Yeah. Hey, okay. Dude, that guy didn't have to work. And we got free shit, so it was like a win-win for everybody. There you go. It was awesome. My my mine of choice was uh, Nitroflex. Oh yes, dude. Uh, Nitroflex was good, and like my my buddy who was, uh, I think he, I think he just got his kinesiology degree. Um, I was in the Navy with him as well. Was, uh, Matthew Paley, he was awesome. Funny, funny, funny ass motherfucker. But he showed me that because it was like one of the lesser pre workouts that are so harmful. What, was Nitroflex the fat burning one, or is that the one that was kind of like a fucking rock? It was it was the white container. I think it was a fat burger. Yes, well. so I do remember that. One. They had a PM like a nighttime, <laughs> mm-hmm. and nighttime pre workout. No, it, it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> it was like to go to sleep. But oh, it was like a fat burger in your sleep. Yeah. And the guy gave it to me, and I remember he told me he's like, "Hey, you're gonna have some fucked up dreams." <clears throat> and I remember my dog was licking my foot in my sleep. Yeah. But when I woke up. Or in the dream, I thought he was biting my foot off. <laughs> and I woke up and I had legit pain in my foot for like hours. It was wow, terrible. Dude. And I never took it again. I'd like to experience that. I'd like to see what that's about. Nitroflex, there you go. That's intense. I actually, there's a, yeah, they're, st- they're still around. There's a there's a pre-workout. Uh, when, I, when I moved to Lake Elsinore, I bought a new one because they didn't have Nitroflex. It was called Mother Bucker. That and sounds awesome. I should have known just by the name alone that it was going to do some weird shit because that's the only pre-workout I've ever taken that gave me heart palpitation. Oh Holy my shit. God. And I was like, like, I'm never taking this shit again. <laughs> this is fucking horrifying, dude. I thought I was gonna like have a heart attack in the, at the gym. You're like that. You're like that black girl that drank a Celsius for the first time. You seen that video? I think I have. She's like crying. She's like, what's the end of these days? <laughs> dude, they tested all those energy drinks: Celsius, uh, yeah. Monster, Red Bull, and they came up positive for like. Um, for methamphetamines and, <laughs> and Amen. All, Amen. All kinds of crazy want, stuff. Want, brother. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's all I need, want. brother. Those are, those are the wings we're getting. Give me the diet <laughs> mat. That's exactly what we need. That's right. To wake you up. That's what we're getting. That's, that's why I'm like so addicted funny. to monster still. Dude, I had a monster. I had a monster phase in Japan when I was going through lockdown. Was it different out there? Oh, no. It's good. Well, I'm, I, the only time I drank it was on base. So it was all American. Um, but the blue, no sugar one? The yeah, dankest, yeah, the, dankest yeah. fucking flavor. I don't know how I didn't have a flashback looking at that. but the best flavor. Yeah, dude. That, that was like my room was right here. I, if I left my room, 40 feet down the hall was a vending machine with That's it. That's terrible. Yeah. I don't know how I didn't fucking have a heart attack in my room, because I was just doing that. I was get, I was go I would go to the Seven Eleven that was inside the base, which was like less than half a mile away. I would get a bento box and like some chicken, and then I would go to that vending machine on my way back to my room, get a monster, and just play games. Yeah, what, what games <laughs> you playing? What games? At that time, not even at that time, just in general, like right now. Oh, right now? Oh, dude. I mean, I'm back on Halo. I I. I I've loved Halo since Halo's the earliest game I remember like seeing. Me too. You know? Like when I was when I came conscious as a human being. Halo three. Ha- Halo uh Combat Evolved was mine. So are you an Xbox guy? <laughs> I'm a PC guy. Oh, PC guy. But at the time, I was a uh, like during the console, my console days as a kid, I was Xbox, like full full on because I had a 360, and I was yes. that big goofy mic just yelling at people like, "Oh, sort of damn if you don't." <laughs> I love that thing, dude. Oh, or for two lobby yeah. type days. Yeah, sometimes when, when like <laughs> when I'm in the group chat or something, I'll, I'll be like yelling at somebody, or like somebody will send a pissed off voice memo, and I'll send a picture of that 360 mic. I was like, "This is that." energy (laughs) those um, toxic chats yeah exactly dude nobody nobody will ever know like all my homies now like uh like the ruin guys especially besides sergio uh sergio and chris they probably know but like noah and all the young guys dude they will never experience a halo 3 2008 lobby (laughs) like or like a call of duty 4 og lobby that shit was awesome dude with those shitty mics you said call of duty 04 yeah Yeah, or or no uh call of duty 4 oh call of duty 4 Oh, okay. gee, yes, Call of Duty. Yes. That's awesome. That was when I first learned what quick, quick scoping was with the R700, yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. They had the ACOG and the R700, man. Like, you would run around and just, like, I, I that was the only time in any Call of Duty game I ever quick scoped because it felt so natural. I, I quick scope 
stupid. Every Call of Duty, I'm a fucking I god. I can't do it I anymore, dude. It. I, 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 I couldn't do it after that, man. And I was never good at it. I was never good at it. And I was late to the game, dude. Because I was always uh, I was always about GameCube, Game Boy. Oh, and yeah. we never had wi- we never really had like the best Wi Fi either. Yeah. So I definitely strayed away from all the video games. Okay. That makes sense. And I was definitely a PlayStation guy as well. Nice. nice. Oh well um I was so I was three sixty for majority of my life, but uh we got a PS3, and to this day, I've been chasing the dragon of Killzone 2 bot mode. I loved running the bot mode on Killzone 2. Then I think it, I think on the PS3, it went up to like 64 bots, uh. and I was like, it feels like I'm in a multiplayer lobby. But like I, all the backwards compatibility on the PlayStation is so shit. Like you have to stream the games to play. Yeah, it's horrible, dude. But um, and the bots will even be just as good as like people in a random lobby as well. You could, they have so many difficulties. Maybe I'm looking at it through a nostalgia lens, but when I was playing it back then, I was like, that was kind of fucking difficult. <laughs> See, I, I hate the nostalgia lens because like my homie would be like, oh, dude, you gotta play yeah. Star Wars Battlefront. Like they just dropped the OG one, like remastered, I think. I heard it was shitty. And <laughs> it's shitty. Yeah, <laughs> it's fucking uh, shitty. Yeah, I heard it was like it optimized horrible. And they, my friend got all pissed off at me, and I was like, dude, I know it's nostalgic for you. Yeah. Cause he's like thirty something, right? Yeah. And then I was like, but for me, this is apt. That's my friend Ryan, bro. Or is she the vocalist Ryan? He to this day, like he's probably playing Battlefront two right now, Galactic Conquest <laughs> on the OG, like <laughs> on his Xbox. Like that motherfucker loves Battlefront. He, he's gonna. He hates me now. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't like it. But uh, oh, back to the question of like what I'm playing in general. If I were to give like a general game, Dark Souls. Dark Souls is my fucking shit. I love Souls that shit. Yeah. I've I never played any Souls game besides Bloodborne. Which I, I hear it's goaded. I hear it's goaded, so it's a good one to play. That's and I heard favorite. some of the hardest games ever, too. Yeah, I hear oh, they're the yeah. hardest ever. So, my um, when I was in high school, I got Dark Souls 1 my, I want to say my sophomore year into my junior year and I spent that entire summer from sophomore to junior playing Dark Souls 1. It took me like a month and a half to beat it the first time and then after that I think the fastest I ever beat it was like four hours because I was eventually I was eventually doing like speed run basically of it because I, I love that game. This entire piece is a Dark Souls piece. I love that game so fucking much and to this day I think it's the best one but that's just I, that, I can blame that on nostalgia. But see but, but the um, thing is it probably is the best one because whenever anyone talks about uh, like an Elden Ring they call it a Souls game yeah so it's like, like all those Souls yeah. like games because hey, that's I, like the 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 best the formula it's, it's, it's a yeah, formula it's a blueprint yeah. um, but it took me I think it took me like 10 years to no no it took me like 7 years and I found out about Demon Souls, which is the one right before it, and it, it's it's not shitty by any means, but you could tell like they were missing a lot of mechanics that are like detrimental to the Souls like series. Um, that game is hard as fuck. That game's harder than fucking Dark Souls. Um, I still have yet to beat that one. I, I've been playing the remaster too, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, that game is really, really hard. I heard you mention Hell Diver earlier. You and Hell Diver. Love Hell Divers. Love, dude, when that, I, I had been hyping that game up because I played the original. Did you play the first one? Yeah. The first one is uh, entirely different. It's top down. It's like it's like yes, a, yes. it's like those uh, yeah it's like an arcade shooter and like a stick uh, shooter. You have to like uh, you have a three sixty aim. It's like that Tokyo City GTA. Yeah. Yeah, it looks just like that. Yeah. So it, it was like that. I played the shit out of that one. Um, and it was the same thing. It was like a community-based thing. Like you, all the Helldivers working together against three forces that are you trying to get... Illuminate everything already does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Illuminate... Are, dude, if they're... If they're transferring them over to Helldivers 2, how they did the automatons and the, the bugs, the Illuminate are going to be scary as shit. Well, I've already seen like concept... Not even concept, like in-game files of what they look like. It's scary. They're squids. Right, they, they're, they're fucking awesome. aliens and shit. Yeah, it's, really that's cool. that's like the most alien one. You know, um, yeah. No, Helldivers one. That was like I played the hell out of that. So when they announced Helldivers two, I was literally watching that uh, that video game, the video game awards or whatever. And I think I was watching it with my brother, and I was like, oh shit! And he was like, was it what you expected oh, though? No, I had no clue they were going to go third person. And that is such a good change, dude. It, they knocked that shit out of the park, man. And I know, like, uh, Bungie and all them were fucking jealous. Yeah. They could have done that shit. Yeah. Dude, you know who's the most jealous? is the fucking uh, Starship Troopers game. Because Helldivers 2 is the best Starship Troopers game ever made. 
without even being Starship Troopers. It's funny that like, uh, what is it like a double A company did yeah. something like that? Just like Power yeah. Worlds, dude. I I was I'm very familiar with uh, their Arrowhead games. Yeah. I played their other games called Magica, okay. and they're super like uh, they feel super DIY. Like it was like it feels like some guys in their college dorms made this shit. So it's crazy that they went from that to Hell Divers Two, and like Hell Divers Two is competing with shit like Halo and Destiny and all that stuff. Like. That's such a big come up. It's insane. That's D, that's DIY and like it's fine. It's full of like, games. I don't know if you've seen anything <sighs> over, but th- something like monumental happened recently with them and PlayStation. Oh, with, oh, with the the account shit. So PlayStation like is like <coughs> their sponsor. I guess they kind of own them. They're taking them on under their wing. Pretty much. Yeah. And people thought it was just kind of at that, but it turns out they said you need a PlayStation account or you can't play, including the Steam like the PC players. Yeah. yeah. But there's like a hundred some countries that don't have PlayStation Network. Yep. So there was like all these countries that are just being cut off from Helldivers. And people threw such a big shit fit over it, like bad reviews and like everything. It went from like very positive or like overwhelmingly positive on Steam to uh, like mixed reviews, which is overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam is like 96% and above of approval rating. Mixed is like 55 to 60. Oh. Overnight it went like that. Yeah. And then like all you see is it just like up, 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 and then it just drops like in one night because everyone, like the whole community... (laughs) <laughs> all put bad reviews at the same time and it was so bad that PlayStation canceled it. They just rallied the troops and yeah. said we're going to get this shit shut down. that's never happened before yep. in any game. Yep. It's, it's kind of like happened. it's kind of like with what happened with the stocks and GameStop, AMC. Yeah. It's happening yes. right now. It's, it's it happening. was a uh, uh, mob mentality, man. Yeah. It's dude. mob mentality. And uh, the PC players are fucking good at mob mentality. It's insane. Like they'll change shit overnight. It's fucking nuts. Have you seen any but, mods on the game? I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen the Master Chief one and the, the Clone Wars one. That Clone Wars one is sick, bro. That uh, I'm selling my. Uh, I just got a new computer. I bought it off my roommate, and uh, I should, I'm selling my old one to uh, the vocalist Mashiki Ryan because he saw those mods. He was like, "I need to get this game," <laughs> so he's buying my PC. I was like, "Hell yeah, dude! I'll play that shit with I feel you." Like something for that would need to be like an offline lobby, though. I was talking to Hoser. Yeah, about it. I, I think I don't know because people like. Uh, Unless they have, like, how GTA does it. Because GTA is, like, always online, but you could do the single-player mods and shit. See, I think they need to do, like, a single-player mod because some people like the game how it is. Yeah. And they would go into lobbies with, like, Thomas the Train and Lightning yeah. McQueen. Yeah. So yeah, it, It's surprising you don't see as many mods like that being used for, like, memes and shit, like how the G- GTA ones yeah. were. Yeah. The GTA ones were hilarious, you know? And they have them. It's just, it, it, it's probably just not uh, on the outreach anymore. Yeah. I would say I don't know. I I haven't touched mods on Helldivers 2. I would like to, but I've also... I've kind of been, like, waning off of Helldivers 2 because I've just been playing other stuff, like the Fallout. Lethal Company? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I did, yeah. I played that for, like, a week. Yeah. Uh, The homie homie mods it, so it gets, like, insanely hard, and I'm, like, the biggest bitch ever, (laughs) so anything scares me, so they always ask me to come play because I I scream and fucking bitch all day. I played that game for like a week and like two of those days I played with Angel Morte Buena Angel um, that motherfucker is the same way man he it, it, I'll be I'll walk past him in the game and he'll scream and be like oh, I gotta go I gotta go I got there was the first game I ever played with him he hosted the match he's like yeah this is gonna be awesome man and he, <laughs> we get inside the building and he's like walking down and he hears a noise down the hall and he's like I can't do it, man. And he leaves. <laughs> and so it kicks I'm everyone off the game. <laughs> I've done, like, I got sent to the back rooms before. Yeah. And I've never, I never went to the back rooms. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? No one can hear me. And you just start hearing shit. Yeah. Like, uh, you have like a paranoia, uh, paranoia meter. Yeah. So I'm just like hearing shit in my headphones. And I'm like, holy fuck, holy fuck. And I just keep running. And I just go, no, I can't. I just leave the game. <laughs> exactly. I just, I just quit. I'm like, I can't exactly. play. Start, see, that's the type of scary that I need right there. That's yeah. what I want. What, what are you on, Renan? What do you play? Dude, honestly, I have had no time to play video games yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. No, honestly, kind of same. <laughs> if, if I did play... I've been playing Cuphead recently with a homie. Play, oh, Cuphead? Cuphead? You're crazy. How the fuck do you get through that? No, I, I don't. That's Dude, the thing. I'm so hard. Garbage. I played that for like two days with my brother, and I was like, I'm never playing this again. It's so hard. That, that's coming from a guy whose favorite game is Dark Souls. Uh-huh. I was like, fuck that game. That game is hard as shit. But, I mean, 
And you do that in your free time? You do that to relax? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I get together with the homie because he's shit. he's he's completed it yeah. so many times, and he's a professional at it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I need his knowledge. I need his ways yeah. of Cuphead because I I'm terrible at it. I don't even know why I said that because like I used to play Escape from Tarkov in my free time. Uh-huh. You know what that is? I've heard of it. Have you ever heard of that? I've never heard of it. Escape from Tarkov is a hyper realistic tactical shooter, and you yes, can only yes, okay. you can only get it through uh, Battle State Games website website, and uh, it, it's a pile of shit now. I, I can't stand that game, but I was I started it when lockdown started, and I played it for up until like a month ago. I kind of waned off, but. Um, my main time was from like 2020 end of 2020 to like uh uh end of uh, start of 2022 so uh, it's a hyper realistic tactical shooter so hyper realistic that if you bring a gun from inside raid like a typical m4 you can take it down all the way down from the barrel you can customize it and like you could change the grip on it. you could change the housing of the barrel you could change the the iron sights you could change them to, as long as the parts are compatible it's you could change it it's a gun nuts dream and is it kind of like a modern warfare type level or even higher than that it, oh it's way higher not modern, modern warfare i'm sorry more more like the most recent call of duty in, in what regard like as, gameplay as or? far as the customization of the guns and stuff oh, it's like that times a million really literally dude like you can change the tips of the barrel to like suppressors to co- compensators you could change you you could change what trigger you use the color of the trigger uh-huh. the the each trigger has a different rate of fire and stuff ergonomics there's an ergonomic level on it you can change the grip and different grips give you different ergonomics and stuff which is like how fast you lean and shit like that how fast you move around um but it's so in depth that you you it's transferable to real life. Mm-hmm. Like everything I learned about guns, like I love guns. I, I, I know a shit ton about guns. Everything I learned was from that game. That game taught me so fucking much. Aren't they in like a lot of heat right now for like their DLC coming out? Yeah, I heard a little bit about this, like the Unheard Edition or yes. something. It's like $250. That's why I don't fuck with them anymore. So it's like, They're well, so for, stupid. So like last year they did like this uh, DLC thing and it said you'll get, it was like 150 bucks, which is like yeah. crazy. And they said you'll get any future for free. Yeah. So now they did a $250 one. But if you go back to the last year's one, they removed the the next year's free. They updated the fine print of it, yeah. the, the, the shit. Yeah. So now it's like... So they're scamming you now. Screenshots of it, and they're like, it said this, but they removed it. So yeah. Yeah. They're, they're totally fucking everyone. It's a community. fat case right there. But, but Well, you would think so, but they're, they're a Russian company. We can't do shit. Oh, so, okay. like, uh, they, it's entirely Russian-owned. Um... But I think I think he lives in like Europe. The guy, the main developer of it all. Um, but yeah, no, I I was playing the hell out of uh, Escape from Tarkov, and which is why I was like I shouldn't be saying shit about Cuphead because Escape from Tarkov is, in my opinion, the most stressful game I've ever played in my entire life. Because the whole concept behind it is, you go, you get the game. Okay, you're given a character, you're given a stash. That stash is full of equipment and shit like uh, armor, armored vest, helmets, and. Uh, uh, backpacks and guns that you bring into raid and, yeah. and and ammo, and if you need to re- if you need to reload a magazine in in game, you literally put it in bullet after bullet, like one bullet at a time, uh-huh. and then you get it. That's a new mag, so it's like time consuming. But you you load your character up before each raid. You give him all the gear he needs, like chest rig, helmet, backpack, gun, necessary ammo, extra bullets if you need it. If you go on that raid. And you you live even like it, it, even if it's like five seconds in you get shot in the head all that equipment is gone Fuck. forever yeah, well you can get it insured which costs money your character's money which has a limit or you can like you can bring shit back from raid and sell it and all that stuff but insurance isn't guaranteed if you get killed by a player and that player goes to your body he can take all the shit off of you and take it out of raid and like that's his shit now so when you're loading them i know you're saying bullet to bullet on the mags right if you were to just stay behind a rock stay behind some shield yeah loading up a bunch of mags can you store them what? Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like if I found a bunch of mags that are compatible with the gun that I ha- I brought into raid, I can load them up with bullets and like I have more mags now. You know, no, but like it's... during during the battle and everything. Yeah, while yeah. Fighting. Like you you open your inventory in the in the middle of the raid and you just load whatever you need to do and you just walk around and shit. It's soup. It's one of the most like tangible games I've ever played. Where, like anything you see, you can like pick it up, and, like use it. Oh, yeah. that's sick. Yeah, it's awesome. 
It's extremely um, interactive then. It was awesome. <laughs> but I, I, you understand the stress behind it all. Yeah. Because like every raid is like that. Everything you bring in, you have a chance to lose it. And it's all this hard shit that you work so hard to get or find or like it's all this it's your shit like kind of like rust in a way i mean i've never played rust yeah. but i know that that yeah. you're always constantly stressing about somebody taking over your shit exactly but the thing with rust is like you build up to that level like you everyone starts off rust naked and afraid you get all you should build up and shit if you lose a stone pickaxe uh that sucks i can get another one easily escape from tarkov you start off with pretty good gear if you lose that you're fucked like you need to like go and raid with like a pistol and like kill a scavenger and <laughs> take his shitty shotgun and then build up you know and it's 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 so unrelenting it's so unforgiving that like I, there's been multiple times where I had to reset my account because I got I just had shitty raid after shitty raid so I lost all my shit dude I can't imagine that the, the shit. Yeah, that makes you that, that's what kept you going yeah. back and I was playing that in my free time <laughs> after work from the military I was like let's relax just stress <laughs> It was horrible, but I don't know. I, I liked that game. I liked it a lot. And then there was like a lot of clones that came out. There's one coming out called Arena Breakout. Okay. It looks a lot more forgiving. Uh, I'm probably going to hop on that because it's not being run by those shitheads at Battle State trying to steal our money. But um, yeah, no, I don't know. It's that it, that's a it's called an extraction shooter. That's like the genre, wow. you know. Um, and that is like the most stressful one, scariest one. I, I played that for a little bit with Angel, like a couple, I think last year. And like, it's just, we were always stressed. <laughs> Sounds dope, but I feel like it would be too stressful for me, but with a group of friends, yeah, that's I, the move. Are you either of you into guns? Yeah, totally. Yeah? Guns? Totally as well, well, just don't own any. Raised by a Marine, that makes sense. <laughs> well, we, we took, or uh, my friend invited me and Hoser out to go shooting, and I don't own any guns, so he brought all his whole get up and that was his first time so it was oh dude it was for me it was awesome uh, uh, from a gun nut perspective alone that game is badass like you, you don't even have to um you don't have to get the weapon to see what you can do to it there's like a gun build mode I think I don't know if it's still there but um you can like just customize dream weapons and shit like it's insane um how like tangible it all is but uh yeah, I'm I'm a huge gun nut, so I was I was in heaven playing that shit, but I don't play it anymore now. No. There was this. Uh, what were you saying? If you don't mind asking, do you own any yourself? I don't have any. No, I haven't. Uh, I got in. I got really heavy into guns when I moved, like towards my end time in Virginia. So by the time I was like going to Japan, Japan's no gun country. Uh, so I was yeah. like, I can do shit, but I have I've shot so many guns in my life and majority of it was done in the span of like three days because where i was in virginia um my apartment was around the corner from a marine base it was a, i think it was called camp allen uh in norfolk virginia and on that base there was a fire firing range and at the time this was well before covid it was like 2019 i want to say at the time ammo prices were dirt cheap and um it, guns weren't like nearly as like uh, uh crazy yeah well they were but you know they're way more in the spotlight nowadays um but that firing range seeing as i was a veteran or seeing as i was in the military at the time i got like discounts and stuff on it so i remember one day we went in it's a saturday we went in for like five hours and i shot upwards of 15 guns uh, a mixture of assault uh, of uh, ARs to pistols to shotguns and I in, in that day I shot a P90 I shot a Vector I shot a Mark 14 I shot a 1911 and I shot like three 12 gauge shotguns oh, yeah. yeah dude it, I have like multiple videos from like back then on my phone but it was like I'll never forget that day because that that was probably the day where I fell in love with like guns like be, just being a gun nut so even like in the Navy didn't do it what do you mean? Like, you didn't shoot really any guns, like, in oh, the Navy? Oh, well, you go through basic training for, uh, for the Navy. Because, I mean, the Navy doesn't, you don't need a... Unless you're, like, on watch and, like, something happens, then you got to shoot. But I, I rarely saw like a gun. the Army and then the Marines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there was... There's this job called... Uh, I think it's called ICF, where it was, like, a temporary assigned duty that I could have done, but I didn't. Um... Where you're basically a base cop, and 
to get that job to like be in that job entirely you're required to do like two weeks of gun training Mm -hmm. and one of those days requires you to shoot an m240 that was my only that was the only thing that made me want to do it was shooting an m240 that's the uh the light machine gun okay not the saw Uh but the longer version it's fucking huge i think it's like like i saw a video of my friend shooting it and he racked it back and it sounded like a robot just (laughs) Like, oh my god <laughs> that was like that was the only thing that made me want to even remotely do that job was shoot that gun does the navy ever get into like um going against pirates and stuff like that oh yeah dude like well, is that mostly coast guard oh the coast guard handles like stuff that's obviously near the coast that happens like that but um my ship didn't ever get any, into anything like that but i mean if you're like a pirate and you see an aircraft carrier, you're not going to be like, I'm taking yeah. that. <laughs> Best fucking pirate ever. Yeah. But like, I, I, I'm sure destroyers run into shit like that or like smaller craft and stuff. And they're just like, um, they, they have the air horns and like one MCs and stuff. They're just like, don't even think about it or some shit like that. You know? So, it, so Somalia, like the pirates in like that area and stuff are pretty fucking stupid, but they're smart enough to know like, don't fuck with the U.S. ship. Yeah, Don't fuck with the big gray ones. Yeah, exactly. But um, I, I I think I remember uh, some some of the ships responding to like shipping containers that would be taken under siege and stuff like that. Like, well, they're definitely there for that. Like, Coast Guard would definitely help with that too. But um, Coast Guard was mostly like mostly like a humanitarian relief type thing, you know, like floods or something like that. Uh, but yeah. Nothing really crazy like that happened when I was in, but uh, a lot of creepy shit. Like that was that was probably where I was mostly like looking into alien shit and all that stuff because I would always go outside and the uh, at nighttime during the aircraft carrier and I would just like our friends would be like, "Do you fucking see that shit?" We would see like weird lights and all that shit. Like, dude, just being out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, dude, it, I've never seen darkness like that in my I, life. I mean, I feel like just down in the sea, it could be it. It's a completely different breed of Dude, scary so what majority of where my do- job took place was uh on the base level of the aircraft carrier so like it's like base level then there's like three floors that and then there's the flight deck and then below that there's eight floors okay so base level if i were to walk to the side of the ship it's a hundred foot drop to the water or no no sorry it's 50 foot drop from the flight deck it's a hundred foot drop so there's eight floors below that and if I was like in the fifth or sixth floor, there's some weird fucking noises that happen. Like, like it, 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 it was always so scary if I was like on watch and it was like 2 a.m. And I would just be like sitting at the galley or something like that. And I would just hear on the wall like a hook. It sounds like a hook is like scratching on the wall or something like that. Oh, or like a, or it sounds like a, like a, a, a spring. Like, like, dude, it, it's so you crazy. You just hear that all the time. Yeah. And it's just like, it's like 10 inches of steel is just separating me from whatever the fuck is making that noise. You know, it could be some giant fucking creature or something. But I don't know. My, my dad always used to tell me that because uh, he was a, he was a radar or sonar tech and so his job was just like headphones stare at a green screen all day oh, and just listen screen. yeah for like 12 hours at a time um but he said he, he he always heard noises that he couldn't explain like every single day or every single week he would hear shit that he could never explain but the majority of it was like uh, he would hear just whales or creatures and shit like that and so it was like um, but th- there's like a famous story of like the I think it's called the Boeing or the the, the bloop the bloop it's called the bloop and um like a common occurrence for submarines to hear this noise that sounds like a boop like that and they just don't know what it is They're, they've explained they explain so much there's so much stuff they hear that they can't explain from some like the submarines but the the bloop is like known for being like what the fuck could that be you know and like do they get scared when they hear it no i mean technology is so advanced on on a submarine that it's like you feel i, I assume they feel pretty like well taken care of like we can get out of here if we need to like I'm sure they're not like oh the Kraken's fucking outside or something like that but like I, at least for me when I was on aircraft carrier there was never where I was like we're gonna get like and something weird's gonna happen and we're gonna fucking sink we're on a fucking giant yeah. nuclear powered ship yeah or was, was yours nuclear powered uh, I, I think so our, well I know majority of our moving stuff is like magnets and shit but the majority of aircraft carriers are um, steam 
uh, like the, the all the old ones and the ones in World War Two. They, they, they just kept steam. I think the one I was on since it was new might have been nuclear powered. I'm not. I don't entirely remember. But um, I was also just working on trucks, so. <laughs> you, think, you think the megalodon is still out there? I do. I think anything's possible in the ocean. We've only discovered like five percent of it. Like, there's probably some fucking thirty mile long creature in there that we just don't know about. It's yeah, terrifying. It just evades yeah. you. It's too horrifying. deep. That's fucking horrifying. When do you think we'll, we'll ever get down into I that? I think we'll discover more about space before we really? find out about the ocean. Yeah. Do you believe in aliens? Fuck yeah, I do, dude. I. I, I was telling myself on the drive over here, like, if I get into aliens, I got to chill out. <laughs> I can go on for our, my family can tell you, like, I am the alien guy. Because do you guys remember when that shit, like, got brought to Congress and shit? Yeah. I was already deep into aliens and, like, all that stuff. And when that shit got brought to Congress, I was like, yes, validation. I'm going to tell everyone I know. <laughs> so, now, so how, big, how, big one of those, huh? How deep, how deep <laughs> we talking here? How deep we talking here? Oh, dude, I, I've I've been researching this shit for years. I love I love it, and it's not even it's not even like a, a research that I'm like it's gonna take over my life if I get too deep. It's curiosity because like I it blows my mind that there's anyone that isn't curious about that. Like there's people that it blows my mind that there's people that don't believe in aliens, but it blows my mind that there's people that don't give a shit whether or not they're real because it's like yeah I get it we're on Earth like we're stuck here but brother like. That's fucking crazy. Another civilization. And I just heard recently that the James Webb telescope discovered um, a planet that's in a habitable zone. And it's it's not confirmed, but it's giving off signs of light pollution, like city light pollution. Yeah. So they're like, it, it's ignorant to say, but like it, it, that, that, that looks like a city. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. And they're like, they, my dad told me that on his birthday a couple of weeks ago. And apparently prior to that, they found it out like two weeks ago. I was like, why are you just telling me this now? You know how I am. You know how much I love this shit. Like, Their nightlife is probably popping over there. Well, yeah, uh, exactly. The National uh, Space Station, that's what it's called, right? Huh? The National Space Station? The ISS? Yes. Yeah. Um, they'll be, they, they live stream it, right? So when like an astronaut goes out there, there's like this famous UFO called the Boomerang. It'll come up and they'll like block the camera and shit. Huh. Like That's on awesome. live stream, like there's so many videos of this boomerang UFO that like yeah. passes through. Yeah. And it's super famous and then they literally will block the camera so you don't see it. You, you definitely have to like go into this stuff with, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? With like a heavy hand of like, you're going to be looked at weird. <laughs> and like don't, don't ever solidly agree on something until it's given to you in such a fa such a form because like the, anytime I talk about aliens or something like that I know how it's viewed I know how people are, people are going to be like it's fucking psycho like he thinks like an alien's going to drop down or something like that but everything that like when, when it got brought to Congress and stuff even then I was like like this is cool None of it's confirmed, though. <laughs> but it is giving a little more validation to, uh, like, when people talk about this yeah. shit. So it's awesome. But you need to go to, you need to, like, confront it all with, like, a safe, like, uh, uh, mindset. Like, right. I think that mob is growing oh, bigger dude. and bigger every single day. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of dropped down recently. I haven't heard much about it. And especially after that Mexico alien shit. Uh, Did you see that? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, uh... Like last year, I want to say, like October time frame. Around there. Mexico had a, uh, they had their own congressional meeting. <laughs> and the, the president of Mexico was like, uh, he he approved uh, this guy who was like, he's a known hoax artist, artist I guess. But he brought some uh, bodies that they found in Peru. And they're alien bodies, apparently. But nobody confirmed it nobody he, he said his the guy said my scientist confirmed these are alien bodies like of course your scientist did <laughs> but nobody nobody in the like uh, professional spectrum of like uh, DNA research and stuff will touch those because if they do their credibility is gone these, these were dolls of plaster uh, yeah yeah they look fake as hell they look fake as hell so I don't know I um when I saw that, I was like, there's no fucking way. My mind was being blown. I was like, no way there's a real. So I, I held off for a while. And then, yeah, it's like, it just seems like a hoax uh, nowadays. So. Did, did you ever watch the movie Nope? I love that movie. So what did you think about that angle they took as far as like uh, the way that aliens were? So I like that movie a lot. 
Uh, Spoiler, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoiler. It's it's okay. Okay. Yeah, for anyone that hasn't seen that, I'm about to get real deep into that. So, um, I like that movie, but I, when I saw it, I was so underwhelmed. I was like, I was mad disappointed when I left the theater. Because, uh, well, not really, because I liked the creature that they went with. That was fucking dope. But, um, that scene, do you remember that scene where he first goes in the barn? And he's like checking like what the noise was, and it's yeah. like the alien creatures that yeah. were the kids. That was such an awesome way to introduce them. Everyone in the theater, I felt it. They were like fucking scared as hell. And then I found out it was a joke. I was like, oh no way, dude. So I was like holding out hope after that that it was still like humanoid aliens. But then it found out it's like a creature. So I was like, ah, oh, that, that's cool. <laughs> Which I mean, I'm not a huge Jordan Peele fan. Get Out was awesome. Uh, I didn't like Us, but Nope is fun. Us was weird. Us is very weird. Uh, I watched it again recently, and I still am like, eh, whatever. But um, Nope was my favorite one, and that's it's mostly because I love I love aliens. I love the concept of aliens. Like Signs is one of my favorite movies. Oh, dude, that was the first scary movie I ever watched, and I that, the Mexico scene. That is what fucking especially the Mexico scene. Yep. That is what put me off of scary movies because I watched that shit when I was like five. Yep. Oh god, that Mexico scene is so scary. He's just that, in his little closet watching it. Oh that picture, god, that picture of the alien, the blurry picture, it still invokes something in me. <laughs> so this you've day. seen it, right? I'm, I'm gonna have to watch this. Dude. Oh, dude, it's it, fucking it might, terrifying to me. It might not hit you as hard at 24, but if you were like, y- y- when you watch it, picture it through the eyes of like a nine year old, yeah, and be like, this is fucked up. Because way back, yeah, it's it's fucking scary for a kid to be watching. Dude, and I, I watched the movie pretty recently. I'm saying within the last four months or so. Yeah, I think Alien Code is what it's called. Alien Code. What happens? So pretty much what it's about. It's uh, this one hacker. He gets uh, contracted by the CIA or like some real deep government organization yeah. to decipher something that was written on like a satellite. Uh. A code that From, was given to them. Yeah, and so I guess that he just spirals within like quantum realms and yeah. like time, and it's just it's it's insane, man. It blew my mind. I, I've never heard of that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to find the name of it yeah. after and give it to you, but it, it was insane. You want a good like scary alien movie? Sure. Um, the Fourth Kind. Oh yes. I've heard of that. Yes. You've seen it? Yeah, that was terrifying. That I was. <laughs> Uh, oh no, you're good. I, I I think I was like, seventeen or eighteen when I saw it, and even at that age, I got traumatized. It was horrifying, dude. That last scene with the hip, hypnosis and shit. You remember that? I dude, I haven't watched. I only watched that once. Never again. I watched it. Dude, I watched it the second time in my life, like a year ago, and I was like, yeah, this is still fucked up. <laughs> but that that one time got me and I remember that scene for the rest of my life there's a scene at the end that's just fucked up but the whole the whole it's like a found footage type of oh, okay. when it was when it came out it's all fake um but when it came out <clears throat> It was based on true events, like the alien sightings were based on true events, but everything that happens in the movie to like the character is fake. But when it came out, the 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 uh, the marketing for it was so well done that it made it seem like real. <laughs> and um, the movie, the way the movie flows is it combines like film footage with found footage. Uh-huh. And the found footage is like so well done that like it, it it fits the vibe so well and it scares the shit out of you. It's so bad. And they, they utilize like um, on the because uh, it's like abdu- abduction victims um, that she's talking to because you follow you follow a therapist, a, a psycho, a psychoanalyst. And she's interviewing these abduction victims because her daughter disappeared. And it was like she's thinking it's the same deal. So she utilizes hypnosis to um, unlock, like, the repressed memories Uh and stuff. And it's like there's some fucked up shit that happens to the the characters that are getting hypnosis. And that combined with, like, the alien aspect of it is super. If you watch that movie, you won't look at owls the same either. (sighs) See, the thing is, like, I know more girls listen to this shit right now, and she loves scary movies, and I'm, like, the biggest bitch in the world. (laughs) So it's like, I know I'm going to have to watch it, and now I'm just getting scared. My hands are sweating right now. And it's not only what he was talking about, the scary content of the movie, dude, but the whole movie has this, the whole 
color scheme and the tone of it yeah. it's just eerie and yeah. creepy oh it takes place in Alaska a fucking the terrible place yeah barren <laughs> yeah. nothing else yeah. yeah so it's it's scary my man. hands are literally sweating right now because yeah. <laughs> I know I'm gonna have to watch this shit so you're into horror movies as well oh uh, yeah I, I, I wouldn't say it's like my thing but I love like like the thing that's my favorite horror movie of all time. I like I, I think found footage movies are probably some of the scariest out there. I love found footage. But there's this That's one, uh, Hell House. I've never seen it. I think I've heard of it. Hell House Origins LLC, something like that. Yeah. And uh, that thing is terrifying. Yeah. So pretty much these uh, ghost, ghost encounter guys. Yeah. They they go into this house and try and document this insane. Oh, it's house. a ghost found footage movie. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. And, fuck. well, not only that, but it's some culty type stuff as well. Ah, oh, fuck. I definitely recommend that. Paranormal Activity, the first one. Did you see that in theaters? Ter- terrifying. Dude. When I was a little kid, terrifying. Yep, yep. I saw that shit in theaters. Never saw it in theaters. What? I've never been to a horror movie in theaters. What saw- type of reaction are you, is the crowd giving Paranormal up? Paranormal Activity was fucking crazy. I remember people in the crowd. I, I, I remember, like, hearing stories that people were fainting in the theaters. Yeah, I didn't hear that too. Stuff. And I had we I had to put my shirt over my face because I was so scared. Yeah, I could feel the tension in the theater when I when I saw that because I saw it as like a teenager, and that that's why like you've never seen it. Well, I've seen it, but okay, I've okay. never been to a horror movie at the movie theater. So you watched it like a living room or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay, that times a hundred. Yeah, in a theater. And knowing that there's other people there and you feel their tension, like, you know, you understand what's going on and how oh, fucked up the scenes are and stuff like that. It's, it's insane. It's I, like when I watched Infinity War, when Iron Man, you know, did the snap spoiler yeah. and everyone, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, everyone started cheering and shit. It yeah. was crazy. Everyone Take that, America, like, did, flip it on its ass and the tail end of like tension and scariness. It's and that it's so level. loud and like. You know, movie theaters sometimes like the room will shake. It's yeah. oh, it's just gut wrenching. Yeah. But I feel like that was at the peak of like horror and well, recent. Yeah, like, recent horror. Yeah, and that was fucking years as far ago. as packing out movie theaters, because so, you're not really getting that no. big a crowd pulled yeah. from a new recent horror movie. The thing, the thing about Paranormal Activity though that happened was, was like I, the reason it blew up was because it did found footage right. It was the first like. It was the first found... Like, Blair Witch obviously came out in, like, 99 or something like that. But um, that one got pretty viral for its time because it was uh, was marketed as, like, this happened. Like, this is real. And it was the first found footage movie. Like, I think it was the first found footage movie ever. Yeah? So people were like, I've never seen a movie like this. This fucking happened. And it scares the shit out. Yeah, and, like, everyone mobbed to the theaters and shit, like, like, watching that movie. Um, so the genre was created with Blair Witch, Blair Witch, and the paranormal activity came in and like did it right. They they did that shit perfectly. The way they like, the way it was shot, the the events that happened, and like the marketing of it too. Like, I don't know. It just they, it, it, the stars aligned for that movie for it to blow up as it did, and to be such a like a critical movie going experience. You know, I don't. I don't think I'll ever see a found footage movie like that again. The only thing that um, came close, and it's not really even a horror movie, was Cloverfield. Yes, mm. I saw that in theaters. That's my favorite found footage movie of all time. But that in theaters was awesome, dude. Because in the marketing, that I think was better marketing than Paranormal Activity. But it wasn't. It wasn't horror marketing. You know, it was like the mystery of it all. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you ever, if you were like deep into the marketing of it all. No. So. That came out, like, I want to say 2007 or something like that. So the internet was, like, in its infancy. And I had a computer with, like, a shitty Wi-Fi USB thing that, like, took 30 minutes for a picture to load. So I was, like, on YouTube watching all the marketing videos. And I was, like, uh, it was saying, like, oh, a satellite fell in the ocean. And there's, like, there's words of a creature and shit like that. And all the commercials were, like, go to this website to see this and that. And I was, like, oh, so they just kept going deeper and deeper with it. That's awesome. And I was, like, 30 being like I'm looking into that or I'm doing this I was like and I was like Clover on YouTube like Cloverfield monster explained and shit like that the marketing had me in a chokehold dude it's funny because I do that now with like video games and shit yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's to get the easter eggs yeah, yeah totally it's all exactly. the easter eggs so the lore yeah I exactly. like it I love yeah. it and then like uh, the lore's still going to this day like it, it there's a, the Cloverfield series it's like an anthology uh, and there's like three movies out and each of them have like references to each movie and shit I don't know if you saw um, I think it's called like the, the Paradox 
complex or something like that. It. It, it took place on a space station mm-hmm. and shit. And like apparently they, it was like a it was a particle collider in space, and uh, it was the biggest one in the movie. It's the biggest particle collider ever invented. It was in space, and they activate it and it tears a hole in space time. But you don't find that out until the end. Spoiler, sorry. Um, you don't find that out until the end that it's a tear in space time. It, it's kind of a shitty movie, so it doesn't really matter. But um, they 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 tear it open and then they they go back to earth but it's not their earth so they find out as they're going back that like it's not their earth and the last scene in that movie is the clo- the cloverfield monster coming out from earth and it's like way bigger than the one from cloverfield so it's like it, it's like what could happen you know but apparently i've heard recently that they're like trying to do a sequel to cloverfield okay. so i hope they fucking yeah. do dude i i love that movie so much that monster had me like in a in the death grip like just trying to find out where it came from and shit like that and just like the concepts behind it jj abrams man insane awesome. director yeah but found footage love that shit Get it off the movie topic. Uh, I'm just going to apologize to Sergio now. Sorry, Sergio. We didn't get to do this for you. Um, usually every guest we have on, we ask him two questions. Okay. And we kind of ran out of time with Sergio. I want to make sure we get it in this time. Okay. We'll ask him next time. <laughs> but uh, hold it if you want to ask him the first question. So our first question we want to go ahead and ask you is who is your biggest inspiration or hero? Like person? Ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. It could fictional, whatever. Mmm... I don't know. I, I, I never, I, like when I, when I create something or if I have like an idea or something, I don't, I don't, I don't, I've never had it based on a person. I don't think, I feel like it's a thing. Like That's everything, totally everything I've ever created, everything of like I've ever uh, done for myself was based on something I saw. So like, uh, like I literally got into powerlifting because of how hype anime got me. And like I remember, I was like twenty one, or so. Or no, no, no. Sorry, I was like twenty three, and I was watching like My Hero, uh-huh. and I like all the fight awesome. scenes would yeah. get me so fucking hyped up, and I would see guys in the gym with anime shirts. I was like, that shit's badass now. I'm gonna start lifting. And I would like lift and you know, all that shit. And one of my homies would lift or like work out to watching. Uh, he would like be on the bike watching like All Might fights and shit. Uh-huh. I was like that's awesome. And so like it got me like that. So I I don't know. I I guess. Uh, Fuck, if I had to put on something, like Blade Runner, fucking Blade Runner 2049, that gave me the snowball effect into music, into creating my own stuff. Because I was in bands before and stuff, but I was following somebody's lead. You know, I wasn't creating the music, I was just playing parts, and I was going to local shows and just like having fun. But after watching Blade Runner, that was the first time I ever created something of my own. Uh-huh. And it, it snowball affected into something as big as a Shiki. Now, Shiki's not huge, but it's gotten way bigger than I thought it ever would. Like, we fucking, we played with Malevolence this past weekend at Chain and snuffed on site. And I'm just like, I made this shit in my room. <laughs> that was the spark to your fire right there. Blake. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, and obviously there's like my dad, like my dad, he's always kept me, um, he, he he's the only person in my family that's like completely understood what this shit means to me and uh he's the only he's the only one that's like actively gone to my shows and like have brought has dragged family members uh with him to go to it number one fan right there yeah um he he he, he's definitely been like a big uh help to it all and like inspiration for me to like keep going and like he and he comes at me with a level head too so he's not like go at this full force he's like Go at it, but make sure you're good. Make sure you have a plan B. Like, I don't want you to, like, end up on the streets or something. Like, I'm good. I'm good. I got it, man. So he comes at it with a level head, you know. So, yeah, I, I would just, if I had to put it all in one thing, Blade Runner, because that gave me the snowball effect into music, into creating my own stuff. And then my dad just for helping me through it all. That's awesome. So, so. Yeah. And then our second question is, if you had an opportunity to talk to your past self or your future self, mm-hmm. who would you talk to and why? Oh, that's a hard one. Or about what? <laughs> I, I oh, man, I feel like I feel like a big part of me wants to choose my future self just to see what happens, but I feel like that's a huge waste. <laughs> so spoiler maybe, alert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, why would I want to ruin that? Um, maybe maybe past self just to like fully engage with what 
thought processes I had at the time. Because, I, I mean, I remember how I felt about, like, certain things, but I don't... I don't entirely remember how I felt about, like, like specific bands or something like that, or, like, how I felt about writing music at the time and stuff like that. Or even if I... I don't even remember how... Uh, it, like, when I was uh, in high school, if I even had a thought of writing my own music. Uh-huh. I think I was just, like, full-on, like, all... My friend Wyatt was the... Uh, main guy in in the band that was writing all the music and I would just follow his lead and I was like maybe I just thought at the time like I'll just follow Wyatt and do whatever he does you know so um like I don't think I don't think back then I would even maybe try to go tell yourself to think about your creative side more yeah yeah exactly or or even tell like hey like you're gonna be like creating your own shit (laughs) like it's gonna be awesome um you're gonna create a truck band (laughs) you're gonna create a a song about a dog (laughs) Beef. Uh, oh, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's fucking great. But I don't know. Um, probably past self. Yeah. Just like update them. <laughs> like it's going to be all right. Update them. Yeah. Fine. You're going to be real good. That was, a, that was the first update one. Yeah. <laughs> Is it, do people usually pick future? Everyone picks past. Okay. So okay. far. But they always. Well, actually, I think actually, except for uh, Redneck, he picked future. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think. But uh, you, uh, they usually pick pass and they usually just kind of like say it's going to be all right. Yeah. You know, something like that. Yeah. I mean, that was the first time I've ever heard someone say like, hey, you're going to be a fucking badass. It, it's hindsight's 2020. You know, like it was like we were just saying, like, why would I want to spoil the future? But it's also like curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> so it's like, I want to see what happens. See, but the thing about this, like you can go, you can go to your future, right? And just be like, so are aliens real or what? Yeah, exactly. You can like ask him about all kinds of crap that happens to him. Or you even had the chance to change the whole trajectory of your life, you yeah, know, by yeah, going to the past. Yeah. Go back. Go but back. that's also scary. It is yeah. terrifying. I'd go back and put five dollars on Bitcoin. Be a fucking billionaire. Right now. Yeah. Put three hundred dollars on Bitcoin in two thousand seven, <laughs> and you're 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 all right. Exactly. I keep seeing these videos I, of like. Go go ahead. Sorry. Motherfuckers buying Bitcoin in 2007. Yeah. That mean it's like just absolute dominating on Modern Warfare. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> my um, my dad had a, had one of those stories. He he he. His friend told him, and he had spending money at the time in like 2008 to buy this stock, and he did it, and he regrets it. He said he's till this day he regrets it. So, like, damn, I think $500 back then he would be close to like a billionaire. Oh Holy my shit. god! Yeah, I, I remember he told me like the price he would have nowadays. No, what what stock was this? It, oh, it was, was Bitcoin. It? it was Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. His friend told him in like two thousand seven, two thousand eight to buy into it, and he had the spending money at the time. He just chose not to because it, it was looked at as a bullshit coin. Mm. So, but now it's like fucking crazy. I mean, I'm not big into it myself, but I. I, I mean, I don't know much about it either, but yeah, exactly. I'm like base knowledge on crypto at all, so. Um, but yeah, he he would be loaded right now if he had done that, like set for life. But I can't imagine that I have that regret. Fuck that. I'm glad my regrets are just like local shows, <laughs> like not going to much local yeah, shows. Yeah, you mentioned earlier like you didn't, or not even just going to local shows, but not like really. Um, I don't know how to put Absorbing it. Like it. absorb it. Yeah. I uh. I said it on on like the episode with Sergio, basically like. I don't know. I just love local bands. I just can't get enough of them. It's amazing. I, they're, they're, the energy there is completely different from like a big festival. Yeah, and uh, I think I told you at the show um, when I when I when I joined the military, the first like year and a half to two years, I spent. I was too busy. I was too busy to even engage in the local scene. Even if I wanted to, even I came, even if I went back with that mindset, I would be too pissed off, too stressed to even want to engage with that stuff, just with all the bullshit that I was going through at yeah. the time. But don't you think that would have been the perfect place to go exactly yeah but like knowing me back then and how i manage my time i would it would be a detriment um i would either i would either fully go into that or fully going into taking care of my body and like uh, uh, mental health which i chose taking care of my body and myself uh instead of going back into music but um and i also like didn't know where to start because I was in Virginia. So I, I knew where to start in California because I had my friends and they got me into it and stuff like that. But I didn't know anyone that was into that kind of music in Virginia and stuff like that. And if I did, I worked with them and they yeah. didn't know. Uh-huh. It was coworker level, like coworker core. Shit like, hey, you listen to a data or a member? I was like, yeah, man, of course I do. Um, but uh, I, I lost track of where, where I was. Oh, local local bands. Um yeah, no, I, I, that was that was that was it. I just regret not going into that 
level back then, and uh, you'll never you'll never you'll never see anything like that type of DIY, especially in hardcore. I'm not a hardcore guy. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to everyone and be like, I know like the terror and all this shit and all these hardcore bands and shit. I was always more of like like my gateway into DIY hardcore and metalcore was like grunge and new metal. Wow. I was always a new metal kid, always a grunge kid. Um, like. I think I, I listened to like Alice in Chains and shit mostly and then I somehow found pop culture knocked loose when they dropped that uh, EP in 2014 uh-huh. my, my drummer at the time showed, showed us it on Bandcamp and we were like this is insane it's fucking heavy as fuck and then they blew up from that um and then uh, the, the, the one I can blame it all on was Balancing Survival and Happiness from Kublai Khan. Uh-huh. That is like my snowball effect in the hardcore. Because I heard that I heard that in 2014. And I had already been playing music, but I had a, I had been like, all my influences were like System of a Down, uh-huh. Rage Against the Machine and shit like that. And then that album came out and I, show, uh, uh, I listened to it and I started like... Uh, snowballing into deeper beat down and hardcore and all that like more local stuff like exploring band camp and all that stuff and it was just it blew me away I had finally like found genres of music outside of like radio metal and stuff like that so but um yeah no that that it taught it also taught me it taught me about DIY because at the time uh, Kublai Khan was playing like living rooms yeah. and shit I remember watching them on YouTube in like 2014 uh, there's a black and white video of them uh, in a living room and they're playing like the only shit off of Balancing Survival because it was they, they had just dropped that album like I remember the Guilty Dog was played on it and shit and there was like 25 people in the crowd and it was just the, the song went hard as shit Matt Matt was actually moving back then like nowadays he just like walks around and he's like Turn people into guacamole and yeah, shit. Like he's just walking people, walking in a pace. But back then he was like jumping around, and fucking two stepping and shit. Yeah, he was moving. And uh, he also, you could tell too. He also didn't have technique in his vocals because he was just, that, that. That was that was what got me the most about that album was how pissed off he sounded. He sounds angry as hell, and it's like what it, I think it's their most emotionally driven album. Um, from the lyrics alone and shit I think he calls out his dad too in one of the songs and like just that paired with the how angry his vocals sound I was like this is insane I've never heard anything this mad before like, I thought Nirvana was pissed off but this guy is fucking angry mental note so. yeah <laughs> you've never heard that album? no I haven't checked it out. brother dude that that to me maybe it's just me being an old head that I think is their best release See, I, like, I've, I've heard I've heard songs off the album but I never really, really paid attention to how angry he is brother dude I gotta take I gotta give it a good listen yeah, yeah next time you listen to it try to listen to it all the way through track one all the way through and pay attention to the lyrics like bring them up on Google or something like that it's very angry the, the song Dropping Plates when I first heard that song I thought it was about the gym I thought it was like lifting or something like that it's about a waitress dropping plates and being pissed off at the world and like like she she's done this for the million time this week I'm gonna fucking fuck yeah, the world you know yeah, paying attention to to everyone's lyrics more see but sometimes it's a little harder because you can't it's, even understand it, them. it's hard I have only recently gotten into that like I think I was like 23 when I actually started paying attention to lyrics because I got into music as a musician so I would listen to music for the instruments whereas like and maybe that's not why I, maybe that's why I'm not like as huge of a hardcore head as much as I am like metalcore or something like that um, because hardcore is heavily driven by its lyricism. Uh-huh. The biggest bands in hardcore have the craziest lyrics, have the like most hard hitting, heartfelt lyrics I've ever heard. And like uh, terror. Yeah, exactly. And it, it like terror is like literally all about like bond and like keeping your word and shit. Yeah. And it's like some of the craziest lines. Like uh, uh, Jacob, big ass trucks guitarist, he's a huge terror head. He tries so hard to get me into them. And I, I don't hate him. I don't like dislike him. Yeah. It just, uh, hardcore doesn't hit as much for me. And I think it was just how I was, I was brought up yeah. because I love, uh, um, like metalcore is such a broad genre and it's so wildly sounding on like different spectrums. Like you can go from like 
of Mice and Men, like, drum, drum, breakdowns, to, like, As I Lay Dying, like, Shred Fest, to Every every Time I Die, Rock and Roll, sounding metalcore, to, like, On Broken Wings, Mosh, like, it's, it's crazy, dude. It's fucking crazy how different it can be. Whereas, like, hardcore can be different, too. Like, there's, like, groovy hardcore, and Pain, Pain of Truth, uh, TUI, and shit like that, and then there's, like, traditional stuff, like, Terror, and all that, like, or Madball, and, and stuff like that, the, the like, two-step beats and like the heartfelt lyrics and yeah. stuff like that don't get me wrong it's not like bland as hell and I, I I will firmly say no live energy meets a hardcore DIY show or even a hardcore show in general yeah. the, it, a no barrier hardcore show beats any festival out of the water to me um, I agree I have a lot of friends that will agree on that um, but yeah like I grew up as a mu- musician so if the instruments didn't have some kind of like variation or like a hook riff or something like that, it, it, there was a high chance I probably would have been bored and, and such. Cause like in metalcore, a lot of the songs have hooks, have like distinct breakdowns, have distinct noises that like grab my attention. But um, hardcore is like a lot of lyricism. It's a lot of like, gang shots, like or mic grabbing and stuff like that. And there's that in metalcore too, but it's mostly focused on like the breakdowns and like the the, the crazy sounds you can make in, in the in the genre. But um, yeah, I just I didn't pay attention to lyrics for like a majority of my life. And then uh, I actually sat down with um, balancing survival and happiness in, in my early twenties. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I f- can feel his pain in that fucking, in those lyrics. Like, I gotta pay attention more. So, but uh, yeah, no, I just, I don't know. Maybe that, I think that's the main reason why I'm not as hardcore as I am metalcore. You, you had mentioned that you seen like uh, Matt Honeycomb, he's kind of lower energy now. Yeah. Honeycut? Sorry, yeah. I said Honeycut. Honeycut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, sorry. Uh, it's already 40 and slip, you know? Yeah. Um, He's, like, more low energy now. Yeah. Which makes sense. He's 35, and he's been doing this for, like, 16 years. Hey, man, look at Scott Bogle. Oh, no, I think he's been doing it at 20. True. Very true. Oh, he moves, too, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Damn. Guess, What's oh, his excuse, then? What well, the hell? <laughs> but, uh, I've seen you, like, guest for Smoked, for yeah. Whirlwind, and, um, obviously Big Ass Truck now, and then, uh, you have, like, this fucking energy. It's contagious. It's... I, I try to be angry. <laughs> it's so angry, and I, I I try to make myself look as pissed off as possible and sound as pissed off as possible. And then like, I was thinking about it at the, at the show. I was like, I look really pissed off. I'd say when I saw the videos of myself, and then people come up to me, and I'm just like, What's up, man? <laughs> uh, when we first met you at the Long Beach show, you were yeah. just super calm, super chill. You were just sitting next to me, kind of like yeah. next to the band members. Yeah. And uh, I didn't even know you were gonna go on on. On, on stage yeah. quote unquote yeah. and I was like where the fuck did this come from yeah. this was insane energy it was supposed to be Angel but Angel had to work that day he had just gotten promoted and so he was like at the, the heel of his work uh, works foot so but um, Bubba hit me up the day before and he was like is Angel coming? I was like, no, nah, man, I'm sorry. He's got to work. He's like, you want to do the feature? I was like, I already knew you were going to ask me, bro. <laughs> I already knew I, like, I, he was going to, I was going to be the second option because I, I told them a while ago that I was going to be there. Like the minute they announced it, I was like, I'm there. Because, um, and a lot of, a lot of uh, the fucking Knock Loose show got announced, like, right, I think it was right after they announced their uh-huh. record release. Like, damn, that sucks. And that show, that show was actually a, supposed to be Big Ass Truck's first show, quote unquote. Um, because it was originally going to be at Gilmore's in Long Beach the music store and uh, uh, I told him Big Ass Trick will do it but the only way we'll do it is if Smoked gets on because it'll not only will it make things more convenient we could do Corn Fed too because David will be right there so our idea was going to be Smoked was going to go on in the middle of the show and then we have the same layout as Smoked lineup wise. So literally just hot swap people and we would play Big Ass Truck. That we, we would play the song Big Ass Truck, open with that, and then we would go into Corn Fed and David. But uh, Smoked couldn't make it, so that got thrown out and then uh, they got a, they got like an entirely different lineup and they brought it back to the Lodge. Yeah. Because they weren't going to do it at the Lodge because of all the heavy bands that were, they wanted on it. They were like, we don't want to damage the property. So I think the heaviest band on that bill was Marrow. 
I love Marrow, dude. That was the first time I ever heard of them. That was awesome. I had heard of them, and I, pl- I played with them before, but the show I played with them, I had to leave before their set because we were playing two shows in one night, so I had to drive somewhere else. So I had been wanting to see them for a while, and that was fucking awesome, dude. Justin's a, Justin's a scary-looking vocalist. Just, dude. Yeah. He's a vocalist. He's awesome. That's a big boy right scary. there. I've yet to meet him, but he, he's... His like just a fucking hulking man. <laughs> it's like a fucking tree. So as far as big ass truck, so the reaction that you got on streaming and live is that the reaction that you were expecting when you guys started this whole thing? I, I knew. Okay, when I made it, I was like, this is so dumb. I know in SoCal, it'll blow up because our homies love us. I love my homies, and I know they'll share it. And I know it's so dumb. Everyone will get the joke. Uh-huh. And it'll like I knew shows in SoCal at the very least would be dope because all our friends would be there supporting us. I didn't know it was gonna blow up like it is now. Cause somebody, you know what happened? Uh-uh. We it wasn't our doing. We just made the demo and somebody, somebody, posted a screenshot of their Spotify. It was Beef playing in the single version. They posted it on our hardcore, the subreddit hardcore, and just with the caption, Haha, funny band name. It was big ass truck. And they were like, ah, oh, dude, this is crazy. And then that got like thirty thousand views or something like that. And it like it was the it was the top of the, the subreddit for like two days. And that got us to like five K monthly listeners off the bat. And ever since then we've been We've been on a big post on our hardcore every week, and I think it's weighing down in the past couple of weeks. But um, every so often, you'll see like, "Yo, what's uh, what's a crazy band with insane eight oh eights in it?" And so we'd be like, "Big ass truck," and like on a, on the subreddit. And um, I remember when that when when the reason I saw that uh, first post, the very first post I got posted on hardcore. Um, my roommate Steven, he was on uh, he was on the, the the Reddit and it popped up on his uh, his for you page for Reddit and um, I heard him yell. He was like, ah, ha, ha, Abel. and I was like, what the fuck? I thought he was going to show me like a, a funny hard lore moment or something yeah. like that. And he goes and he's like, you're on, you're on the hardcore subreddit. Immediately, I was scared. I was like, did I? do a cringy dance move or something it's like what happened and then i see beef and he's like yeah look man and then he typed in on that comment uh section because somebody was like i think the top comment on that one was like i bet all i bet these guys i i bet every member of this band is just a fat bald white guy uh-huh. and he he, re, he responded to it he's like i'm the i'm the vocalist roommate he said he saw this and he loves it <laughs> that was awesome man and steven's but, actually the reason why i found out about you guys so he posted a bunch of band a bunch of um, up and coming bands yeah right his favorite up and coming bands yeah. and you guys are one of them yeah sure yeah, yeah. really <laughs> he had a couple pictures of other of a couple others, but your guys stood out, so I was like, on Instagram, uh, I th- Twitter. I mm, honestly, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay, I, I don't have Twitter. It might have been Twitter. Maybe it was, but um, I. That was the reason why I got into you guys. That's awesome. Yeah, he he's he's always like shown support for Big Ass Truck ever since we've been creating it. And he gets the joke, so it's awesome. But uh. Yeah, he, he, I actually met him for the first time at a Nishiki show, but I had been watching him for years prior to, like, uh, I found him when I was in the military. I, it was, like, right when I first joined, because I think he started in, like, 2015 or something like that, but um, I found him, like, 2017, 2018. So when I, like, like, if I were, like, that question, if I were to go back to myself in my past self and tell him, like, hey, you're going to be roommates with this guy, I would blow my fucking mind. But now I see him, I'm like, oh, what's up, Steven? <laughs> Like it's just, it's wow, just kind of home. Yeah, literally, yeah. <laughs> All right, you're live, man. Awesome. Sorry, right. guys, we're back. Technical difficulties, like always. <laughs> That's the dungeon, baby. Awesome. Unfortunately. Uh, yeah, fortunately. Yeah, no, this is this was awesome. <laughs> it's exactly how I thought uh, it would be. Sergio hyped you guys up like crazy. So, since we only have a little bit of time. Uh, Shout out all the homies, obviously. Shout out Ruin Provoke, uh, rest in peace, Morte Buena, uh, all the IE bands, Darsum, God Awful, Smoked, and uh, I love every single member of all those bands. Um, got some things in the works. 
I am currently doing a metalcore project with uh, Angel uh, from Marte Buena. So we're, we're working on that. We've been writing demos left and right. We actually just finished a song last night. We just got to record the live drums for it. Um, no, no definitive date on that yet, but it will be, we'll, we will have something released this year. Um, and then we're going to be booking shows for that. Big Ass Truck, got definitely want to work on that more. That's like my stupid baby. Um, I love that thing. But we're, we're, I, I want to record more in the summer, get something out, uh, more, more stupid features and stuff like that. We have a show June 22nd in San Diego. It's awesome. like a little, basically a festival. There's like 11 bands on it. Big Ass Truck? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's Big Ass Truck. We're playing with uh, like Forced to Suffer, uh, Bolt Her- Cutter. There as well, right? Hereditary. I fucking love Hereditary. Shout out Gabe. Gabe's the shit. Um, yeah, the Bolt Cutter, I'm really stoked. They have a song called Peter Built Homicide. Holy shit. Oh, that sounds God. crazy. The cover art is like a fucked up Peter, but dude, it's awesome. Those guys are awesome. Um, yeah, big shout out to you know, everyone on that show and all that stuff. And uh, what else? Uh, Shiki, Shiki's got. We, we got some shows coming up. We're working on a, a, a new record and all that stuff. We're recording with Manny. Shout out Hatred Six Audio. Um, Haven show coming up on Sunday. Second? Uh, the Haven show on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, oh, this this will come out after. This will come out after. Uh, we're going to Lodi uh, June first, though. Since that's not this Saturday, next Saturday. So we're going to Lodi. We're supporting a band called In Chaos. Um, pretty dope, dope ass like distance chord metal core. <laughs> it's really sick. Um, very stoked for that. It's gonna be at Wildwood Skate Shop. Uh. Yeah, so Ishiki, we, we got we got shows planned for the summer and all that stuff. Um, nothing huge yet, but once we get closer to releasing this next record, we're gonna plan like oh, yeah. runs and all that stuff like that. So, but I'd say the biggest thing on my mind right now is uh, that metalcore project. Awesome. That I'm yeah, doing yeah, with yeah, Angel. Beautiful. Care to give us a name yet, or you're gonna keep that? Nah, we gotta keep it for now. We gotta keep it for classified. Awesome. Yeah. I understand. Understandable. Yeah. It's really. Yeah. I I, I should have checked, checked in with them before I do this. That's how, how much, much I, I can reveal. reveal. But I don't know if I was Let us know. Angel, totally I got you. Yeah, you can keep that in, but yeah. yeah. So very, very stuff for that because it's, it's like it's like metalcore, but like emotional, <laughs> like super emotional metalcore with like bass beater breakdowns. So like we're we're already putting on their instruments and shit. And like we're not just sticking to guitar and bass, but like piano. We're trying to get strings in there and shit. Like. We're going all out for this, so. Awesome. And he's, I, it's, it's so funny. funny. When we started that, me and Angel started it, and we merged with two other people. I don't know if I can say it, I won't say their names. But um, we merged with them, and when, when it was just me and Angel, I was like, hey, man, let's keep this on the down low until we drop something. He's like, okay, yeah, yeah. And then Angel came over and wrote with me one day. We wrote a full song, and he was too hyped on me. He told everyone at the show the next day. It was like the Haven show. He's like, yo, I'm going to do project. Like, <laughs> like, you motherfucker. You fucking agreed with me and everything. You were so hyped to keep it a secret. It's the death of one thing, and... You know, another. birth of another. Yeah, it's still kind of down low. Like nobody really knows entirely. Like all our close homies know who's in it and stuff. Like uh, like Chris Rue, we talk about it with him. Sergio, but we we've been having it up with Sergio about that because um, there's like a whole bunch of different metalcore bands that are coming up. Because there's not a lot of that on in SoCal. Like there's metalcore, but it's like. Uh, it's in the vein of like a mice and men and like all that Christcore stuff, yeah. like studio type uh-huh. chord. Like there's a lot of that, a lot of that metalcore here, but there's no like, uh, like undying disembodied no, stuff. Things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And like the, the that level of metalcore. Um, so we like all the people that we know that are doing projects. We're like, if the Sergio said it to me, uh, he was like, if all these bands that he's hearing about, he's heard about like six at least so if they all come out at the same time we're gonna create our own soul cow metal horse scene like how the east coast has all that dope ass yeah. shit like in balmora and like x nomad x rest in peace and all that stuff we're gonna have that over here <laughs> so yeah, like one just got announced called uh, a year ago today i'm not even sure entirely who's in it um but i just followed it off the bat i was like yes we need we need more of this uh-huh. I mean, curse of logo metal core that's that's all we need like there's two there's a lot of beat down and I I, I am a offender myself <laughs> with big ass truck but we need more like of that style of music so 
It's 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 in dry. It's uh, there's a drought. Personally, I'd love to see it. Yeah. I no, same, same. Like watch you fall. Shout out, watch you fall. Shout out, Adam, dude. That band is fucking awesome. We're playing with them on Sunday. Absolutely. That that was one of the main reasons. That, the, for me, that was the main reason I said yes, was to play with them because I want to see them. I want to see them so bad. Even if we did get the show, I I would have went because Watch You Fall is exactly the kind of music that we're heading towards. And it's a banger of a lineup. Yeah, it's it's gonna be dude. Meryl's back on too. Yeah, I'm fucking stoked to see him. Yeah, there's that band uh, Eyes of Salt too. I I think they're called. Um, they're on it and I, I had to be hearing about them a little bit but I haven't done a deep dive of them yeah. I think Sergio gave them like the, the the sign off for when I asked him about them but uh yeah no that lineup's gonna be sick about the gods very dope yeah, yeah. We'll, be, we'll be checking out Eyes of Salt when we head up to uh, to the high desert over there oh yeah oh are they on they're on the Ruin Vogue yeah. show nice yeah, they're, they're on there with them oh yeah very dope yeah that's a uh, uh, all I could think of off the bat. Well, it was a fucking pleasure having you on. Yeah, man. That was really awesome. Really enjoyed it. But yeah, very awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you guys. We'll do this again soon. Yep. Awesome. Peace. Bye.